Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast at the Edinburgh Fringe. Hello and welcome to Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits, a man of many parts, sadly most of which are no longer available. And you join me again for another episode investigating the wonderful things you could have seen at this year's Edinburgh Festival Fringe. And today we're going to be talking about a number of shows which are linked much more closely than is perhaps usual in these episodes. Because the connection today is improvised musical. Hence the name of the episode, Let's Kiss and Make It Up. Because that's what they do. They make it all up. Now, I am fully aware that most people will probably not have ever been to an improvised musical. But you really have no excuse, because they are more and more common. The daddies of the genre, in many ways, are Showstopper, the improvised musical. And I interviewed Dylan Emery and Ruth Bratt at some length about this new form of musical in 2009. And if you want to go back and listen to episodes 140 and 141, which you can hear on our website and on iTunes, you can get to hear the inside view on how improvised musicals work. Showstopper were really the first people to do it in this country on a regular basis, and they started in about 2008. I caught up with them in 2009, when it was still very fresh and very original. Which is not to say it's not super original now, because every day we'll present you with a new show. So, what is an improvised musical, I hear you ask, which means I have remarkable hearing. Well, an improvised musical is pretty much what it says on the tin, in the sense that you will queue up to go into the auditorium, and either outside before you get in, or once you've taken your seat, there is usually an element of interaction with the audience by the cast. They will ask for suggestions. If you've ever seen the television programme Whose Line Is It Anyway? you'll get the idea. They'll ask for suggestions from the audience. Perhaps they'll want a location, or a time in history, or even a name of a show around which they can then generate a brand new show. Now, Showstopper does it in a very sophisticated way. They not only generate a complete new musical based on the suggestions that the audience have made, but they also identify certain songs to be sung in certain genre which have been picked by the audience. So the audience might shout out Gilbert and Sullivan, or Stephen Sondheim, or Bollywood. And what will happen is, somewhere during the course of the next hour or so, the cast will sing a song in one of the styles identified, and then sing another song in one of the other styles. It's a really remarkable feat. And as I say, listen to episode 140 and 141 to hear how that's been achieved. In 2008 and 2009, Showstopper was pretty much your only opportunity to hear a musical that had been completely improvised in Britain. That is no longer the case. Alongside Showstopper, there's also a company called Baby Wants Candy, who do tremendously good work in a similar vein, although they don't go for the genre thing, which is generally quite specific to the Showstoppers. And now there are more and more and more improvised musical companies, particularly at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe every year. This year, I saw five different groups performing improvised musicals. I always make a point of seeing the showstoppers. They have never yet failed me. They are always fantastic. But this year, I also saw four other companies. Waiting for the Call, the improvised musical. Baron Stern Look's Big Naughty improvised musical. The Oxford Imps and the Curious Case of the Improvised Musical. And finally, and it has to be said more plainly titled, the Improv Musical from Warwick University. All of them were excellent in their own way, all of them were slightly different, and all of them had very, very different approaches, whilst at the same time all delivering good quality, highly amusing, improvised musicals. In the course of today's show, you'll be hearing four interviews with those latter companies. I didn't get to speak to Showstopper again because that first interview was so extensive and almost exhaustive. However, in order to illustrate the quality of the kind of music that you can get in an improvised musical during the course of today's programme, you won't hear me rabbiting on in the in-between links. You'll actually hear extracts of songs that were recorded especially for Musical Talk in 2009 by Showstopper, the improvised musical. 
I was very privileged then to be allowed to record one of their shows in order to be able to play extracts in an episode of Musical Talk, and even more generously, they recorded three songs specifically for me and nobody else. There was no audience there at all except me. And you'll hear some of these songs over the course of today's episode. And to get the ball rolling today, let's start off with one of those songs. This is one of the ones that the showstoppers recorded for me and me alone for musical talk. And you can hear them at the beginning asking me for some suggestions from which they extrapolate an entire context and a musical song. It's fantastic. And then, as I say, you'll hear four interviews all about other improvised musicals. Enjoy. OK, wow. So obviously it's set in the rain. Uh, Thoss, give us a uh, location. Well, uh, where well, people might meet. A Victorian bandstand. A Victorian bandstand. bandstand. In the Victorian era. <laughs> That's when it would start, yes, I think yeah, so. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so a Victorian era, a Victorian bandstand. So we see all the people gathered round, enjoying their lovely day in the rain. <laughs> But they don't notice because they're British and they'll go out in the rain anyway. Okay. Yeah, so remember, it's a big build. We're going to do back. So it's a big build. Big build. Silence. And then back. I wouldn't necessarily. You don't have to do a gliss. You can just just do a pause and bang. Okay. Yeah. In a way, I'd say pause is probably better than a gliss because then it's you. Because it's just stronger. Okay. So I can see it now. Yeah. My name is Joshua Seiko and I am the coach and player in uh, Waiting for the Call. And my name is Sarah Spencer and uh, alongside Josh and Hugh, who you'll meet in a minute, we founded the company Waiting for the Call. Hi, I'm Hugh Braithwaite and I'm a player and fellow founder of Waiting for the Call. Now, my first question I think is going to be, improvising is one thing, improvising a musical is quite a different <laughs> thing and I would say harder. Yeah. Am I right? And 
how did this come to be, really? You are entirely right, and we don't do things by halves. If we decide <laughs> we're going to improvise, then we're going to do it musically, oh, I guess. Yeah. Um, There's only opera left. Well, so exactly. <laughs> and actually, Voss, that's a great idea. Maybe that'll be that's next year. No, it came on the back of we took the show Eurobeat to Edinburgh a couple of years ago, and we got talking to a, a group called Baby Wants Candy, who some of you might know, and because a, a world yeah, absolutely, yeah, 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 and because we don't do anything by halves we looked at them and thought that can't be that difficult we can have a go at that and we set a team up and it's been two years in the construction and production and we had a quiet Edinburgh trip last year where we just did a few small scale shows but this year it seems to have got a life of its own and, and Waiting for the Call has while well, Josh and Hugh will tell you certain things that make them unique and certain things that we do that other improvisation groups don't do and so here we are kind of ready to, to set up and, and go Oh I feel you've lured me into a question what is it that's unique <laughs> and what is it that other groups don't do seriously because there are mm. lots of improvised musical theatre groups mm. up this year Yeah it's definitely question. growing <laughs> Yeah it's, it, it is definitely growing but you know, I think what makes us unique is one, you know, first and foremost, how much we work as a team. Um, waiting for the call, we've kind of had uh, two teams. You know, last year when we came to Edinburgh, um, we had like a slightly different team, and you know, this year it's you know a completely different team and a lot of people who are actually new to improvising. But with this team, like, we honestly are such good friends and we love working with each other. And I think what Josh is failing to tell you is that <laughs> the majority of the team are under 18. In fact, our youngest player is just turned 14 yeah. years old. Oh. She's been improvising for six weeks. We, oh, do, we did... Over the hill. Right? Oh, absolutely. Well, we'll probably, probably get rid of her next, I think. Okay, someone younger. Um, but so they are a group that is under 18. And uh, what we've always done as coaches and players is not let the fact that these are youthful performers stand in the way of doing what we would describe as a really pure form of improvisation. Improvisation. So, because we're improv geeks, and uh, so we'll tell you a little bit about that. It's, addictive, um, isn't it? it's totally addictive. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. Um, Professionalism we, isn't the uh, preserve of the, the old. Uh, it's barely our preserve, but we'll, we'll yeah, tell you yeah. how and uh, how we do it. And we do something called a Harold, uh, a musical Harold. A Harold, for those who know, is, is an improvisational show in three beats, separated by group numbers. And normally that would be done entirely through acting. There would be no songs in it. But we've spent eighteen months developing. developing developing and creating something called a musical Harold. So we have certain structures that are in play, we have group numbers in the style of Les Miserables, massive ballads, and although we set ourselves this structure, which is used by most American improvisers, it allows us, therefore, the freedom to experiment on top of that. So in answer to the question that was ages ago, I think we're under 18 and we do something that, that we essentially have created. Mm. I'd like to talk to the two improvisers here, if I may. Obviously, you are friends, you've worked together, you've been to the same school, which is where you yeah, started. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you meet through the group, or were you friends first and then the group was formed? Well, the f I think the fact that we were all on a fringe trip already, as part of the group that we previously described, I think that really helped us bond, because of the initial experience of Baby Wants Candy, we, we were just blown away, whatever Sarah may say. We, were, we, <laughs> we, we felt that we wanted to take on that challenge, and as a group that had already sort of had a lot of fun together, we thought, yeah, this is another challenge that we want to take on. So, yeah, I think we met sort of before that, but it was a fun, so very something that we, uh, we took on as a team. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, for me, I've actually, you know, I left Wellington a year back now. And That's the name of the college. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Wellington College. Um, I left a year back now. And so coming back this year and working with this new team, a lot of them I had never met before. I started improvising with them and we started, you know, kind of getting creative. And now I would consider all of them like some of my closest friends. And I think that's what we've discovered. We've, um, we, we talk about the, the cooperation of the team, but that is utterly vital we've got we've yes. we've sort of had performers who've been i guess not so strong at the um the the skills that are needed to, to work in unison and essentially I think another really clear feature of our show is that we are absolutely an ensemble mm. so everything that we do is done as a group there are no star performers and we always try and say that by the end of the show everybody will have contributed equally and, and had a show that they themselves as performers consider to be well, one that they're happy with Improvising must be and you must tell me if I'm wrong here it must be about supporting and helping each other because you can get yourself down a cul-de-sac <coughs> and, and, oh, yeah. and then someone will come in and say oh, I'm a jellyfish Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Picking an example from today. Yeah. No, um, absolutely. I think it's that's the beautiful thing about the team we have at the moment. I mean, in the past, the teams that we have had 
of struggles as a as to be as a team, as Josh was saying earlier. And I think one of the biggest advantages to the team we have now is that if you can see, because we can read quite well what, the way that each other think now, if you can see someone's kind of struggling with the scene they're in or to move the plot on, we can immediately just sort of help out. And you find that even when people think they've had bad shows, everyone has contributed in a, in a way that's really meant the show has gained something from it. Well, can I tell you what was lovely about today's performance, yes. which I should just, just for history, because it, we forgot <laughs> it was called The Australians of Valentine's. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, I think yeah. it was. Australian yeah. um, Valentine's. Something like that. <laughs> what was lovely was that you are clearly, although you're working very hard with each other, and indeed with your musical crew, your musical director and your drummer, you were obviously relaxed enough in each other's company to enjoy it. Because what was lovely was that when someone said something funny, the people who were sitting down and not temporarily involved in that scene were enjoying it too. And there's nothing more infectious in, in a circumstance like that. You wouldn't want it in Dostoevsky. But um, <laughs> it, it, it's, there's nothing more infectious than watching people enjoy themselves at work and enjoy the others in it. It's, watching, it's like watching athletes enjoy other athletes do well. I, it's exactly yeah. the same on the stage. I, t- I totally agree. And I think, I think yeah. that's, that is, again, another real selling point of our group is the fact that they are genuinely friends, they genuinely want each other to succeed and they bounce off of each other so well and we're at the stage now where somebody will set up a choreographed move and the others sort of by osmosis will pick it up and mm-hmm. and I think that's that's what you strive to get but but we've turned into complete <coughs> improv nerds because yeah. we're just, <laughs> it's addictive it's totally Good addictive because you. we finish a show we analyse it in minute detail what did we do, how could we, and but you're just always you learning, must, oh you have yeah. to yeah. Yeah. and it's like we said, the, the structure that we put in place, it, it's not cheating as far as we can are concerned because it just gives us a framework and then we can improvise yeah on top of that and that's where the real creative stuff comes in so from our perspective structure is everything and actually that's what frees us up to be creatively on the laughing behind is i think the important thing as sarah says to realize is that we love improv just as much as the people who are coming. Well, hopefully, the people who are coming to watch. <laughs> we, but, yeah, we are. Yeah, <laughs> well, we, we, we're just as much fans of it. Really, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, us seeing a friend make a joke like that is going to make us just yeah. as enjoy and, it just as much. And I think that's the thing. We we we've we've, I mean, we've had a really good Edinburgh run this time, but certainly sometimes in rehearsal, you you have to accept that when you get on stage as a performer, sometimes you are going to experience the most amazing highs when you do a show because it's entirely you and the audience are responding to you I guess it's a bit like being a stand-up comedian but when you mess it up oh my goodness it's the worst feeling in the world so you accept the massive highs with the crashing what did I do and uh, I messed it up loads hopefully. hopefully you won't see those in Edinburgh this year <laughs> well I'm a civil servant in real life and that just doesn't happen to me so I, am, I, I envy you those highs can I ask a question forgive me once again Musical theatre is a very wide church, shall we say. And forgive me, just courtesy of being young, I have to tell you this, you won't have seen that much, I guess. How much musical theatre interest did you have before you did it? You were improvisationalists first, I think. That's the thing. We don't we aren't a showstoppers. We we could never get near that level of expertise. You don't I mean, do it in genre, is it? Because no, they're, they're particularly unique selling points. We would, so, yeah. I think, we I consider think, ourselves improvising you know, improvisational yeah, comedians yeah, no, first. But the large, I think the large majority of the group, as we said, we came up to do to do Euromy originally, and that was a musical before, and mm. we'd been into what Guys and Dolls, yeah, yeah. 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 Then we did. You've got some of the classics. Mm. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. one classic. Yeah. No, classic yeah. So I think a big part in wanting to kick on and do, as you say, musical improv rather than just improvisation, was the fact that we all loved the whole musical theatre. Fine. But it's interesting because there are people in the team that have certain strengths. Hugh, for example, is, is one of the founder members of the team and he is both a plotter and the person that puts the cherry on the top with the gags. And so Hugh holds the whole thing together with regards to structure. And then we've got people who are comedians who yes. come along and do the funnies. They're the koala hanging on the tree, That's like in Rory. today's show. That yeah, was Rory. Rory. Yeah, Rory. And then you've got people who are just sensational singers yeah. who are there to provide the backing. And it's also essential and vital that Josh is in the team himself as the coach because... I also coach, but I, I don't perform. So you have an insight and you're able to... to yeah, to yeah, and I think it's, it's definitely the variety in the team. Going back to what makes us unique, it's the variety in the team. We know exactly what each other's strengths are and we provide platforms for each other to shine. 
Um, and without the groundwork, we sort of tried to put in. Rory couldn't have been nearly so funny, but we may, <laughs> when he gets on stage and does something like becoming a koala. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I should say he did that today. It's, we're not just picking no, something from No, that's not. Um, <laughs> that's not something that's regular. Um, but we've, that's we've, his private life. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. But we found people have been so, so kind to us as, as a young group. Um, Baby Wants Candy are, are our mentors now. They have just been insanely helpful, and they've done us um, a whole a whole week's worth of workshops on yeah, rap, awesome. which we're trying to incorporate. Yeah. You may have heard the girls rapping. Perfect. Hugh is now sidling away to go and play Prospero. Thank you so much, Hugh. <laughs> yes, thank you. Very but much. I'm sure I'll see and hear more of you in the future. No yes, doubt. Hopefully. No thank doubt. You no much. doubt. Um, what was I saying? Uh, oh, yes, Baby Wants Candy, and also um, we met with the guys from Showstoppers, who are just lovely and so what's lovely I, we find the privilege of interviewing Dylan a few years ago oh amazing oh, yeah, yeah. but what's so lovely is that the improvisation community is like no other theatrical yeah. community they are so open and giving and it's it's play people bounce off each other and even though our team is young people have reached out and said come and come and have a chat how do you do it come and learn from us and and they've, they've been really open and receptive it's been yeah, lovely absolutely. can I ask the question I'm mean, you know, because <laughs> Members of the public, and this is something that showstoppers people said, that no one actually believes that it is, that you're not going in with a set of at least formula. No. Now, there are some sort of um, shortcuts, and, uh, you know, forgive me, you can see in some groups, I don't know if this is something that you do, but when they're doing an ensemble song, someone who's singing a, a line will look at the next person oh, who's expected no, no, to no, sing. Oh, no, no, we don't do that. And no. so, sometimes you can see that, and sometimes you can't. can't. So, do you have any mechanisms? Well, Josh is very clear in rehearsal that we don't plan at yeah, all. It's in fact... For me, the, the real thrill um, in improvising comes from standing up like with my friends and you know, looking at the audience and being like, I do not know what is about to happen, but let's find out together. For me, it's, it's, it's almost ruined if um, I <laughs> yeah. know what's going to happen, if anything is planned. Um, like, like Sarah said, we have some structures um, you know about like you know, how, to how many song, scenes we'll how have. many yeah. scenes we'll have and presumably ten minutes before and you must all start thinking got to find some yeah, yeah. And, and we and we have a clock that's yeah. also what we I know have. I saw that um, from stage if you're looking out from the stage it was on the right wasn't it I know. yes yeah, yeah. but also we, we well, know that's that a perfectly that understandable and necessary yeah, thing and I think you're in a higher time venue at the moment mm, yeah. exactly and we just we know that the threads have to tie together in Act Two mm-hmm. um, but that's about it and as Josh said it's. It's something that showstoppers were talking to us about is, is, and we think is absolutely crucial. You step forward, so you don't yeah, step back. And yeah, if yeah. things start to unravel, you don't go and hide. You yeah, step yeah. up and you unravel it. And actually, the satisfaction it's of having so poured it together is like nothing else. That's why we do it. Otherwise, we'd have been terrified. If we actually stopped and thought about what we were doing, <laughs> oh, yeah. we wouldn't yeah. do it at all. Yeah. We're idiots. Which is why I don't do it. No, but, um, that's why I don't do it. That's why they do it. <laughs> And I just shout at them. But, but it, it is helpful, isn't it? Because the, the comedy musical is, on the whole, not just you, but other groups, make it a comedy yeah. musical. And I think it has to do that, because it's got to have that flexibility and the ability to laugh at something which is patently ridiculous, mm. or something, you know, a god in the machine has just happened, or everything's come out nice and pat at the end. Do you think it would be possible to do it, you know, would would, uh, would an improvised opera ever work because an improvised opera, you know, as a rule of thumb, wouldn't be funny? I, I, I think, what I'm saying is I think the relationship mm. between improvisation and comedy is so yeah. key. Well, I think, I think what it is, one, one of the most fundamental things about improvisation is the nature of, of heightening every scene. And yeah. musical theatre just lends itself to that <laughs> because it is heightened, exaggerated. They are friends there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, I think it, it's part of fundamentally how you train to do it is heighten, heighten, heighten. And also it's catharsis as well. The musical mm-hmm. gives you catharsis. And as performers, I mean, that's why we love it so much. As performers, you come away feeling purged of your emotions and you think, oh, amazing show or, oh my God, I've got to go jump under a bus because that was the worst thing I've ever done. But that's what we want the audience yeah. to feel happy and upbeat and and I don't well I guess you could do with opera, but I don't know how you would do it without going down the Jerry Springer, the opera route and, and yes. making it comedic in itself. Well, so yeah, I love it, yeah. Yeah, that's that's such an interesting question. That's something I would literally never have thought about. Um, but Josh anyway. will be making another yeah. group and yeah. setting up an opposition to us. <laughs> yeah, but um, definitely, like the fact that it's a comedy musical definitely helps us out. Um, it means that you know we can laugh when we make a mistake, which is inevitable. When we forget what we're called, um, forget where we are, something like that. <laughs> Uh, yes, it was a lovely moment today when one of the characters had to say, "What is my what's name?" What's my name? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And 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 comedy gives us you know, yeah. freedom to. It, it, to it gives you wrong. wriggle room, doesn't it? Because 
by, but, but you can immediately make a mistake into a comedy moment, which immediately yeah. keeps everything up. Whereas you know, there's no, there's no, no one drops a, drops a clanger. Uh, because actually you can always turn a clanger into something mm. amusing, yeah. and it we, seems to me at least. We're so keen that, that we work as an ensemble, so we would very rarely, in fact, ever have solo numbers. We, we don't do that, yeah. it's not about yeah. showing off the voices, it's yeah. about constructing a product of utter loveliness at the end, so yeah. the audience go, oh, <laughs> that was lovely. Can I ask about the conclusion, because another thing that we, uh, myself and, uh, and the person I was going with, a friend of mine, were thinking after the show was, it's more important, isn't it, to have some kind of conclusion that at least feels that it's brought everything together. It's, it's, it's almost more important to bring together the threads yes. than it is to make the thing cohere in any way, but if you sat down and wrote it down, you think, oh, that's a good story. Yeah. And we, I, don't, I don't mean it's yeah. not a good story, but, it, but it, it's coming to a satisfactory, happy ending. In terms ending. of the character's Works wants. better, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. That's that, for the want. audience, yeah, the, the audience wants something that's smart, that feels, mm. oh, haven't they, they tidied it yes. up and put a bow on them. And the shows that make us the yeah. most pleased are the ones where we, we almost let it run and then we pull it back yeah. at the last second and, and that's where we are most satisfied. Um, we've done shows that have just been so, so well plotted as far as we're concerned that we've we thought, yeah, that, and we've, we've taken little things from that, haven't we? And... and I guess even a, even a bad show you learn from, don't you? But fortunately, we've had. Well, it's not such a thing as a really bad show because it gives you the experience. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That is, um, that's definitely a massive, massive point. The thing about this form is you are always learning. You're always learning. When we talked to show stoppers today, they've been going for eight years and they've yeah. said after every single show, they learn something and we definitely are experiencing that as well and, mm. and we'll continue to. Like, we're always learning. And we're getting good crowds and, and what Why, we're hoping you. is... Oh, <laughs> obviously today, I take that ball, personally, yes. But what we're hoping is that now we have some momentum behind us um, we can I think start. Momentum behind is always better than in front. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, so now this Edinburgh has, has hopefully filled us with the experience we need to, to go on and maybe set this up as um, something that we can at least do some London gigs with. Yeah. Which I know, as I said to you this time last year, I didn't do it. I was very lazy. But this year, this year. with my coach and my right hand man. It's an aspiration which is actually going to manifest, isn't it? it, if, it I, has if, to, if I can make yeah. what you said sound pretentious, yeah. I, I, I can. And I we've, will. All, we've all committed a lot to this, haven't we? We've, um... Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, we ran sort of like an introductory workshop to a few of our friends uh, who we thought would be you know, good at and pick and from, up. From there, we've got gigs at drama schools and <laughs> colleges. So, so yeah, I yeah, actually it's... think that we teach something that. I don't think many groups out there well, are that's, that's teaching. Unique. No, yeah. And as you are, I'm good, when I say, I don't want this to send in any way a, a judgmental position, but you are the youngest group mm. doing this I've seen, and obviously I get to see quite a lot. Yeah. Um, but by your, you know, you're no means the worst group I've ever seen. Uh, what I'm trying to say <laughs> is, you're, you. no, forgive me, you're absolutely up there as professionals immediately. Good, There's no good. sense. Well, that's what we want. There was no so sense much. of getting a, a cut price or a, or having to make allowances. There was no sense good. of all oh, these these people are young. Let's cut them some slack. So, exactly. There was none of that. It was these people are young. Ooh, but actually, that just managed, happens to be yeah. incidental to the fact they're making me laugh and it's jolly good. And it's now. there's something. I, I mean, so fantastic about seeing people this young working together and so cooperatively and, and the product is I think well I'm, I started off as their teacher so I'm obviously entirely biased but I have never worked with a group of kids quite like it um, and I think it does have a life of its own and I think it's entirely feasible that we can now play to larger audiences Can I ask a question then to you uh, Josh you're at Wellington College, or you have been at Wellington College. Your time there is coming to an end, or if it hasn't come to an end already. Mm-hmm. You've got this uh, idea that uh, wait, uh, waiting for the call, the name of your group is going to go to London, and on to greater and better and wonderful things, uh, and then become an established group, one hopes. Yeah. That is your intention. Are you going to be doing that in parallel with any of your future education? Are you, you know, are you going to, you know, are you thinking? Um, it's a long, it's a commute for you, Josh. Yeah. If you tell us where you're actually based. Yeah, definitely. Well, well I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, well, I, I have left Wellington, and I'm I'm currently at university in America. So Good Lord. That's, you see, yeah. my, you see yes, my problem. Yes, that's, more than, that's more than a bus ride. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and so right now... And, and what are you we reading, are, uh, I am a psychology major, but it's a liberal Jolly arts good. degree. Um, so I am a long way away, and... Um, so you have a good loud voice, so that's all right. He does, he does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I employ him. Stand on the couch, post and shout out. Um... But yeah, I'm absolutely looking to do this alongside, you know, help out. 
um, however I can, you know, frog with the distance. And, and I think when Hugh I'm and around, I will take the reins yeah. in yeah. the UK. Hugh's and off to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. so, yes, yeah. so they're all, they're all on I the mean, route. everyone's flying to the winds, but presumably this group will keep everyone together as well. Yeah, and if, exactly. if you keep it in parallel with your studies, then it's also there mm. when you finish your studies. Because, you know, we know as well, you know, anyone who knows anything about British comedy will know that university is where you study. Yeah. You also get your comic roots going, and then afterwards you give up everything. We never see a comedy doctor. They all go on the stage or on television <laughs> or whatever. Of course. But uh, it's just, it's something that we are utterly committed yeah. as a team to sustaining. I thought to ask, forgive me, to going back to the mechanisms, I don't mean, um, I'd just like to explore that a bit because there is, a, you know, forgive me, there's a missing link here which we haven't really touched upon, which is actually, and it, you, you mentioned the rap thing today, mm. it was interesting, you'd, you'd obviously done a little bit of rap training, and, mm. you know, rap isn't something that necessarily comes easily to everyone. No. Um, forgive me, your musical director, I think, who I happen to know is not standing you mean, a long way away. Who is from. Dr. William Hathcote, who is lurking in the background. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who has replaced Hugh. <laughs> um, but there were some moments where I think that you almost decided that a sort of nexus point in the scene had been reached. And I thought the, the, uh, the, the rap scene was a good example there. You, 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 uh, yeah. you, 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 suddenly we were presented with this circumstance where there was one character against another character. And it was a, an entirely appropriate moment for what I think of as a versus kind <laughs> of song. And you, you took the lead on that by, by starting playing rather a funky beat, I thought. You know, I'm an old-fashioned man, I yes. have no better words to describe <laughs> this kind of thing. Well, and then suddenly your actor suddenly realised, yes, right, this is what we're into, and suddenly it became alive. And the girls love yeah. that. I, th I think if you've got a, a real emotional connection to something, and it's a really clear direction, then it, it helps me and it helps um, the drummer as well. I can one glance across and we know this is getting angry. As soon as I flick it to a slightly distorted electric piano, that's going to be a wrap, and off we go. Um, and Sometimes so, you're naughty with them, though. I, I, if I you think be. they're they're not giving I, you I what can. the plot requires. Oh yeah, and I, I think really we found that um, if you don't really heighten an emotion and really connect to what the song is about, it's going to be a bad song. Yes. So whether it's a rap. And that's true of any song, whether it's yes. written or improvised. It must Absolutely. Be. Yeah, it's got so, to some truth or feeling in it. So, yeah, rap is, is perfect for a really angry situation, yeah. probably second half of the show, where we're sort of really exploiting the conflicts. Um, rubbish is the first opening number. Um, <laughs> Please, never, never. Yeah. Whereas um, at other points, if they're not quite getting there yet, and occasionally they might fumble around, you know, they're looking for, is it going to be a love ballad? Is it going to be a really emotive, I wish for something yeah. song? A manifesto number, for example, as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I'm the villain and here's why. Mm. And, and once we've got to that crux, then the song will appear and it will be, hopefully, what they intended it to be. And we always tell them to heighten and heighten and heighten and even if you know they think the song is there, it's not there until we all decide it's there. And, and sometimes it's very nasty to them, aren't you? I you have, make I have them the keep going. Say. Um, and just because they want to love that doesn't mean it's going to be quite the one they thought they were going to get. Uh, do you want to meet our youngest member, Lucy Webb, who is now lurking, 14 years old, <laughs> who is so utterly obsessed with improvisation now that <laughs> she's a, a total improv nerd, <laughs> aren't you, Lucy? Yeah, how do you yeah. do? Hi, hi. So how did you join the group? Um, I joined at the start of this year uh, because um, Miss Spencer and Russell Smith were running these... Uh, these, these, this training squad for waiting for the call, um, which because they wanted so to waiting kind of... for waiting for the call. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're a genius. <laughs> That's the name of the website. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they wanted to bring some fresh blood in, and I went to one of the rehearsals and with I some just... blood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, and. I just absolutely took, like, I just But the funny thing is, we then so spoke much. to Lucy's mother, who said that since she was a toddler, she's been sitting on the kitchen floor <laughs> making up stories about inanimate <laughs> objects and singing it's, about them. So we were just tapping into something like that was naturally there. Well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yeah. So we just brought it out, and now Lucy is the, probably the world's biggest improv expert. Yeah. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I, I'm definitely the number one fan of improv, so. Um. Can I ask a question once again to the uh, performers on the stage? Now, you, you work with Will from the school, uh, who's your musical director. Have you ever performed with other musical directors when Will's not available? And is it different? Or are you now so attuned to Will that you would find, not find it difficult, but, you know, that you, Will is as much part of the team as everyone else? Um, I think that was it, yeah. Will is as much part of the team. Today we performed with seven people, but, you know, we performed with seven players, but we were a team of nine. You know, Will and Chris, who's our drummer as well, uh, and it's definitely you know we've I've worked with Will for two years now improvising, um, and 
there's definitely a sense of, you know, I, I know him and he knows me and he knows, you know, certain like facial cues and vocal cues for when, you know, I'm looking for a song and I know um, just in terms of like timing and I, I know the way he works. Um, I, I mean, and we've never, no, we haven't tried with another um, musical director ever, but I would suspect, you know, it would be, it would be difficult, it, it would be a difficult transition. And what, what people forget is that, um, Dr. Heathcote, Dr. Quill, is that he's improvising too, like it's all yeah. improvised, so I don't think anybody could be as, quite as talented as him within that respect, so... Obviously, we'll pay it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we just talk and sing occasionally, but yeah. um, I think he, he does. Yeah. But it, t- it ties in with this organic thing, isn't it? But the, one of the reasons you're so successful and so professional is because you have organically grown into each other's understanding zones and all this kind of stuff. And that's as true for the relationship between the music it is between the performers. I mean, it, it is, it's, it's almost symbiotic, which is one of the things I find so interesting about improvised musicals is that each team does it slightly differently, mm. each, yeah. and that must be because of the personalities. I mean, sometimes they've yeah. got different structures or approaches, as you say. Showstoppers does a very distinct kind of show mm. with genre and things like that, and there was one a few years ago called No Shoes, who don't seem to do it so much anymore. Um, but they, they had a particular twist as well. They had sort of wild cards that the audience could hold up at any mm. time in the performance. But see, I, I'm super mean to these guys. I, again, I, I insist that the we do long form, and I, I don't like them talking, and I don't like them conferring in any way, and we don't stop so we don't have a device of a narrator we don't have any rest moments where they can get themselves together and genuinely they don't listen to the words that they're given until the 10 seconds of thinking time they get on stage so presumably you would never favor a move to a two-act improvised musical because you would always have an, in, uh, an interval and it would never, be impossible yeah. to presumably it would be impossible not to say well look what we got so far does anyone think we're well, exactly. in a two is going to really help i would think the audience would feel fairly cheated i think our gimmick is that we just move forwards like a steamy express train to the finish getting ourselves out of things and I think well, it's I most the fact that you tie yourself to the track and you drive the train I well tie done. them to the track I drive the train <laughs> <laughs> we both get there together and yeah. where, there's, where there's will there's a way oh, yeah. well, he's been so I'll be working that in you see yeah. <laughs> this is because I can't do it the way you do it I have to think in advance and then we'll drive the conversation in that direction it's perfect it's yeah, it, definitely, it definitely goes back to and I mean now Lucy's here to and I think she would agree like it's the for me the joy is you know in discovering with the audience like at the same time like let's all find out what's going on that's where like the thrill is for me it's like writing a novel isn't it over the course of an hour and (laughs) tying yourself with people watching you yeah (laughs) well it's like writing the novel but also doing the television adaptation at the same time (laughs) absolutely absolutely and um it's Thought what we were actually doing, we wouldn't be doing it no. at all, no. would we? It, it is frightening. It's almost frightening to watch because there, there is an edge, you know. Mm. It's a comic edge which, once again, tones that edge away. Mm. It was all done seriously, and you know, you're all on a typewriter, yeah. which is hard with a piano. Entirely. Um, but, but, but you are, mm. and you're on it together. And the more people on a tightrope should make it harder to walk on a tightrope. So this is where this falls apart. But of course, it doesn't. In fact, mm. you're, you know, you're building, you're also building your own safety net. And I think as well, being being young and being inexperienced when we started, I think had we actually thought about what we were doing, we'd never have done it. And I think part of the the, the pleasure of working this team is they're just so super brave, and they have every suggestion that they're given they go with even in rehearsal we've never had moments where you've gone uh oh yeah I think I think we're brave because we all trust like one another however cheesy that sounds like if I step forward and I have no idea what's going on it's fine because I know that Someone's Josh is going to step forward with me and he'll have an idea like no matter what I'm 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 nervous sometimes before a show because I want it to be a good one, but I'm never nervous because I'm worried I'm going to go up there and just freeze because I know that someone will just have my back immediately. Well, improvisation is also, and you tell me if I'm wrong here, it's it's about getting in touch with the non-planning part of the brain. We've all got tremendously well-developed planning parts, haven't we? But it's there's this sort of pool of stuff that just burbles in the background. But we very rarely connect into it. And if we do, we normally take it out, fold it, make something of it and say, ha-ha. But what you're just saying is I dip straight in and take it out. So there must be times when you don't know what you're going to say. I've stepped up. (laughs) I say it happens pretty much every scene. In fact, um, (laughs) what I always tell the kids when I'm working with them is that (laughs) what I would really like for you guys to do is to open your mouth and start talking and we'll get a plot. Yeah. Like what the story will come if you just open your mouth and start saying things. But 
more often than not, we get up with no idea what is about <laughs> to happen and just start talking until we find it. But yeah. you can only make a stew with ingredients, so you've got oh. to put the ingredients in. Mm. So what you're saying is, in fact, just by creating substance and stuff, you are, in fact, giving yourselves the raw materials that you need in um, order to find some kind of plot yeah. solution. What is fantastic about, about these guys as a team is they listen, and like you pointed out earlier, Thos, they laugh at each mm. other. They find each other genuinely funny. <laughs> And, and they bounce off of each other so well, and it's a pleasure. Even if we, even in rehearsal, we laugh our heads off, don't we? Yeah. It's yeah. So yeah. funny. And probably yeah. teasing on stage as well. Yeah. I mean, not yeah. all the business about accent that they were set in mm. Australia, but there were one or two slightly unusual Australian yeah. accents. Yeah. My, my just picked has up. to be American, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. You cannot get away with it. Yeah. We <laughs> love to set each other up as well. So a couple of shows ago, we were doing this one about helicopters, and as uh, you do. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and Josh just. Uh, said to me we just started we were just became helicopter engineers we literally just like passed the got the degree as it were and we hadn't even talked about it before and Josh just looked at me when we were singing and said tell us all you know about helicopter mechanics tell us the manual yeah, yeah. and I, and I just us looked at him helicopter and just gave him like this icy glare <laughs> <laughs> and, and we were laughing so hard because it's just it's just the funnest thing when that happens but it yeah. always comes doesn't it yeah. and actually yeah. rapping which is, is a big part of our show um it's really interesting when we train, you we you always say, don't you just don't have anything in your head, a rhyme will come. Mm. It will just come and it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Little Lucy is is a really good rapper. <laughs> 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 if you could see her now you'd know how funny that is. <laughs> She's like the smallest, tiniest little rapper. There's so much anger in you. Yeah. <laughs> oh. As you can see. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Exactly. Um, like I, I threw Lucy in it a little bit. I was like, "Tell us everything about helicopter mechanics right now." So how long and did the song last? <laughs> 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 Until she ran out of things to sing. Yeah, I did. Yeah, and you know, obviously, Lucy is not a helicopter mechanic. She knows <laughs> nothing about it. But I mean, she opened her mouth, and some stuff came out, and you know, the audience enjoyed it. Working on the magic, none of the fun. audience are as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking words rather than ectoplasm. Yes, 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 yes. Words, words. <laughs> Now, forgive me, let's talk again about Waiting for the Call. What is the future for Waiting for the Call? Okay, well, Waiting for the Call will now entirely be a, an entity of itself after Edinburgh. So, whereas last year we stopped and we collected ourselves and Josh and I and Hugh had lots of meetings about what we thought it could be, now approximately half the team are no longer in sort of secondary education. We can actually do something about it. So, we will be gigging regularly and there will be London-based gigs and we will be looking to move to a larger venue. We have, yeah, we haven't decided whether it's free fringe or, or we yeah, don't know yeah, maybe there'll be a yeah. bidding war you <laughs> never know um, so, but we'll be back at Edinburgh next year Ooh. and we will hopefully have a number of gigs under our belt with this team but also we want to diversify and do workshops for young people because I think it's it's a genre that the Americans are really really familiar with but we just don't do it and no. so universities are really good at doing improv but actually as a, a secondary teacher myself I've, I've just left Wellington College as well that's hopefully how we're going to fund the group I'm going to get out there and do workshops and I yeah. will have to wrap myself on awful <laughs> things like that. You um, look beautiful. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, oh you didn't mean it that way. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it is now going to be a, a theatre company that is up and running and we will, won't we be a force to be reckoned with this time next year. Yeah. And the, like I said, the, the other improvised groups which are <laughs> entirely consistent of adult performers have been so kind I can't even tell you how wonderful they've been I think we're a novelty for them and so they've all come along and said, come come and do a workshop and come and do this and come and speak to us and come and hang out and our contacts book is growing isn't it yeah. and oh, good. yeah hopefully 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 maybe somebody will be listening to this and will say I've got a room above a pub which I would love <laughs> to give you every Wednesday night and that's what we can do but this is not going to stop and and certainly I've left my teaching job so I'm now committed to this full time Josh is going to do the world's longest commute from yeah. the <laughs> University of North Carolina and yeah can I can I just um, if anybody is out there who would love a genuinely really well constructed well formed genuinely quirky improv team that will be guaranteed to get your punches in because yeah. you'll take one look at them and say that is impossible that people of that age could do it we um, a multicultural diverse fantastically quirky genuinely funny entirely family friendly improv group and we have that's one hell of a quote at the bottom I know I know I'm the queen of I'm the queen of yeah, yeah. 
they're A3. They're all landscape. Yeah. Um, exactly. But, um, and we have a lot of high profile people who come and support us and look out for us. And it would be amazing to have a base. So if you were listening to this and you have a, a room above a pub, um, <laughs> be amazing if we could come and base ourselves there. Well, I expect great things from the lot of you, but I don't really have to worry about it because I know you will be excellent. I, oh, I've now, I've had the so pleasure, sweet. Well, I've had the pleasure of seeing different shows from you as a group yeah. over the last few years, and they're always excellent. Oh, thank the you. The improvised musical today was just hilarious. Oh, it was very that's tuned, so it's very funny. I, 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 you know, we, we, we were enlightened by the delight of it. We, it was the second show we've seen in our sort of uh, eight-day oh. tour of Edinburgh, and it, it's been fantastic. And so you thank guys you are much. the experts. So we, we're really proud of that. Thank yeah, you so much. So much. It's, it's much well. appreciated. It's, it's easy to be an expert of sitting in a chair and watching other people. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I love musical but talk. You're the final judge. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you guys see enough to know. Yeah. So it's like I got one of those swivelly chairs that Tom Jones likes. <laughs> 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 no, seriously, thank you very much, and all best luck for the future. It's a pleasure. Thank you, thank you so you. much. <laughs> oh, you cool ministers are fat. <laughs> <laughs> And he curses them in a song before he is taken away. <laughs> I see you standing here in my demesne. You are the foulest, petulant bitches I've ever seen. From stars above and all the waters of this land, I bring a curse, and my curse. I tell you, it's grand, don't worry. You, Ahmed, your sons will die before them. <laughs> and you, Vishnu, will know a grave that's deep and cold. And you, guards one and two, and you, yes, guards three. <laughs> before you die, I'll take you on a project. <laughs> Curses from above violate your love. Curses from the deep, oh, you shall not sleep. Curses from the side, I cast you open wide. Curses from the front, I tell you, as the blood. Curses all around, hear that dreadful cursing sound as I, the sheep, bring it go. <laughs> Take me away. Do with me what you will, now my body be rent and torn. My spirit haunts you like a wicked conscience. Still. <laughs> and full of pudding. Hi, I'm Sarah Fuchs and I'm a cast member in Baron Stonelook's Big Naughty Improvised Musical. And I'm James Lovelock and I'm the director and musical director of Baron Stonelook's Big Naughty Improvised Musical. Well, I think that leads us rather splendidly into the very first question, which is why Baron Stonelock's big, naughty, improvised <laughs> musical. It's a great name. It's one of those hooks, isn't it? <laughs> so tell me a bit about the show and the group and who you are, how you've come to be. Because, you know, a title like that, you think, there's more to this. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, Baron Stonelock is, um, it actually comes from when I used to be a teacher. And I used to, when I was training as a teacher, I used to, I used to have a saying, I used to say, it's all in the nose, that's how you, that's how you control people. And it used to be, you can't see this down the radio, but it's a, you sort of, a, you know, look over your glasses and yes. give a bit of a stern look. So I became known as Mr. Stern Look, and it's been my email address for quite a long time. Um, oh dear, I'm going to get lots of emails. <laughs> <laughs> when did you, when did you uh, ascend into the aristocracy and become a baron? <laughs> I, I think, I think I was just bored, so I thought one day I'd just baron myself, you yes. know. I don't know, that's not, probably not the right word. Baron myself, no, that sounds a bit... Uh, noble, oh. I believe, yeah. And <laughs> yes, I thought I'd ennoble myself. Um, and I've been involved with the improvised musicals for quite some time. And recently I started to do a PhD on musical theatre at Birmingham University. And so I wanted to set something up in Birmingham where there isn't quite as much improv stuff going on as in London. And so uh, I, I, I've been playing with showstoppers for a couple of years and obviously I've moved on to move into uh, move out, out to Birmingham. And we should just explain here, showstoppers in a way are the daddy of improvised musicals. Absolutely. Are they not? Yeah. Yes, they are. They yeah. are. They're fantastic. And so I wanted to kind of start something with maybe a younger group uh, to give people the opportunity to perform quite early on in their 
improv careers. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's why Sarah's involved. Yes, that's how I came here. Cause, mm. Yeah, we did like short form improv. And then we also did a bit of a long short, but not a musical long form. What's his then, short form? Is that just sketches? Oh, sort of like games. Yeah. yeah so like, like whose line is it anyway? Yeah, who's like, oh. yeah, that's a good example. Mm. And then, yeah, and then he convinced me to come do some singing improv as well. So, yeah, yeah. I'm glad he did. It's really fun. I really enjoy but it. Singing improv. And uh, I'm absolutely fascinated. I mean, improvisation is always, well, when done well, is always fabulous anyway. But taking it to the next level, and it seems to me it is the next level with musical theatre, is actually extremely difficult. And yet there are a lot of groups doing it. So... Why did you think that was the next step? And then how do you, you know, forgive me, how does one approach from scratch uh, improvising musical theatre songs and shows, indeed? Um, I, I you think, may confirm them. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to, no, I'm, don't you give my answer. Okay, okay, yeah. I'll try not to. Okay. Um, I, with, with, for me, as a teacher, I think um, I was always really aware that singing was something that everyone could do. And people come to, used to come to me and say, oh, I'm tone deaf. And it, it never is that. There's always a way. It's often people have a voice in a different range to the music that they enjoy listening to. Uh, and with improvised songs, it's just the same thing, really. My niece, who's five, sings songs around the house all the time. And sometimes she rhymes and sometimes she doesn't. And sometimes she goes off on complete nonsense. But it made me realise... I like the real world. I know, I know. <laughs> Isn't it a shame that we don't carry that on all the way? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I wanted to do. I wanted to make people aware that it's something that anyone could do, really. And we've, we have an unauditioned cast. It's a cast of thirteen of people that have come to our workshops all the way through the year. And oh, it's a kind of open. Yes, it's yeah, an absolutely open, open to to anybody. Um, and that, that was my thinking behind it, really. I don't think improvising songs is as hard as people think. People, people just tend to freeze when you ask them to do it the first time, but when you remind them that children do it, and also we have a thing which is uh, we, we always say that the show is already written before we do it, and it's the improv god who's called Martin. Martin, the improv god, uh, is, is in is charge she? of everything. She <laughs> is, yes. Um, she's in charge of everything um, to do with... Um, to do with the show so if it's a bad show then that's Martin's fault and if it's a good show well done us <laughs> I see how that works <laughs> is that true then the first time you were asked to improvise a song was that butter clenchingly difficult yes it was terrifying I think you might have been there it was mm. uh, yeah and I, uh, the first time I ever did it I, uh, I did one verse and then went and sat down and did not want to do it anymore and it, oh, really? yeah but then James might have come into me like try it again <laughs> it's alright if it goes wrong the first time but yeah I think in myself, I think it's more of a personal achievement to be managed to actually see yourself that first time completely mess up and then actually go on to actually be able to do it for real. So. To attain better levels. Yeah, yeah exactly. Huh? So, yeah, it's sort of very sort of satisfying in a way to think back to what it was like the first time and now you're like, oh, no, I can do a whole song, it's fine. <laughs> now, let's talk about the group in particular. I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's notable feature is its youth. Mm. Um, because there are a lot of improvisers around and, you know, it, it covers all ages. Um, from young to old, but a, a group that's consistently young, um, for the most part, is unusual. There are one or two around, but mm. does that bring up any difficulties? And, and I suppose what I'm aiming at here is, do you need to have a full knowledge of musical theatre in order to improvise a musical? That's, that's quite. That's a really interesting question because um, a lot of groups do like to put the genres into what they're doing. And I mean, that showstopper's big. Showstopper's thing, they big ask thing. You to, they yeah. say, you know, give us some options, and people mm. will shout out Sondheim or Gilbert and Sullivan or whatever. Absolutely, but even some of the younger groups here, uh, the Improvised Musical does that as well. The uh, the group from Warwick University, and and that's a. I'm always really impressed when groups can do that because actually as a pianist I really struggle when somebody asks me to immediately go into the genre. But for us I think it's because we are most interested, or the thing that I set it up to be was we are most interested in story and telling a story over an hour. Um, and actually if you put different genres in that's not really what, an, and it, most musicals won't do that. You occasionally get your J Joseph and Amazing Colour Technical yeah, Dream Coat. Yes. Where it's pastiche, but yes. most musicals will stick to the same genre throughout. So in a yes. way I suppose as we've rehearsed the genre will be the genre that I'm, I play in which is the genre that I compose in as well. So I suppose... Just on the record, that, how would you describe that? It's, it's Love probably... Love Lucky, obviously. <laughs> Love Lucky, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's probably... Um, it's more. It's probably closer to sort of Stephen Schwartz, Disney-ish, um, yeah. poppy. You know. Alan Menken. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. That that kind of that kind of thing. It's definitely more poppy than than sort of clever. Yeah. Well, it. it I mean, I've I've heard. You know, I, I went mm. to see the show yesterday, and it seems entirely appropriate. Mm. But I agree. It's um, and this isn't in any way a pejorative statement. It's it's entirely suited for what it's doing. Yes. Uh, and the show we had yesterday was about mermaids. So you know, the absolutely, Disney, the Disney feel did not go amiss. <laughs> 
Yes, it, that Some was... time has got a long way to go before we get a musical about <laughs> mermaids and him, I think. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But that, I think that was important that, that we... And it's not just my style, actually. Some of the cast have certain styles that they sing in. And I don't always play the style they want yeah. to sing in because that would be too easy. But, um, yeah, you've got to challenge us sometimes. Yeah, yeah but it certainly um, adds to the different styles that I play. And when I have somebody that sings very strongly in one style, I have to follow that. And it helps me in, in terms of my you know, harmonic choices and chords and styles and all that sort of thing. But I think in terms of the young, the, the youth of the group, um, it's just it's, it, it's deliberately there to, to keep things, I suppose, keep things fresh and, and not to have perhaps all of the, the baggage that you might bring to it when you've been, been tired. I certainly find that I bring that sometimes to it. Well, I suppose there is the danger of falling into cliche, isn't there, mm. if you know it? You know, if someone says... Not that you do genre here, but if, if you have it in mind to spoof for some time, it's going to be very difficult not to make it sound too much like a song time. Whereas if narrative, I, I'm very interested. That narrative is all mm. um, because actually that is still the core of a real musical theatre. I use real just as a way of differentiating. Yes, of course. Yeah. For a written, pre-written mm. musical theatre when Martin's not involved. Um, <laughs> Because, actually, there's been many a musical which has been about the score and not about the book and has been pants, if mm. I may say. You know, it's, actually, a musical is nothing more than drama with songs yes. to enhance yeah. it. But it must be the book first. So, actually, your idea of narrative first is interesting. Can I ask you a question, the two of you, of the balance between music and comedy? Because, actually, one of the... And I, I think it's part of the British attitude as well, mm. but nearly all the improv groups, in fact, I can't think of one who doesn't do it this way, does improv comedically mm. including the musicals and of course comedy is a very handy way of blurring those lines when things have gone a little bit off the rails yes, yes. is it well how do you balance comedy against music do you have a, 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 a do you have a position on it or does it just happen and some shows are funnier than others and can I then ask you a second question which is <laughs> do you think it's possible to do a straight music mm. a com- a, yeah. comic free musical in an improvised way yeah well we've done quite a few different ones because then quite often we think think about the story think about the song the funny will oh the funny sorry not my water over there the funny will just happen as proved by my hysterical <laughs> comedy genius knocking my water over <laughs> and um, yeah so that's we mostly think about the storyline more and the characters more than trying to be funny because we have done some quite serious ones like we've mm. done ones about people trying to find their real parents oh. and like and some like and couples that are like like been together for years and then broken up and they don't I like some more like serious topics which then sort of like if people are coming to see a comedy show they might be like oh that was a bit strange but then equally if you wanted to see a story then that's really what you're yeah. after yeah we, we tend to try and follow the story I think and what I always say in fact one of the things I say first of all to the improvisers is don't be funny I don't try and be funny oh, really you actually say yeah. don't be yeah and because I know that people will be funny anyway because that's the nature of people. If people get together, then you very rarely have a conversation with somebody, um, <laughs> unless in certain circumstances, perhaps at a yeah. funeral it wouldn't be. Well, and even then, actually. <laughs> Gallows you know, humour, though. Absolutely. You know, it's, a, it's a very British yeah. response, actually. Yeah, and I think, I think that when you bear in mind that that's what people will do naturally, what you don't want to do is people going... I mean, well, it's not necessarily what you don't want to do, but what we didn't want to do was have people going for gags all the time. And we want the funny stuff to come out of what people are doing. Actually, the, funny, the funniest stuff is when people don't even think about it and it just happens and 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 that's what we aim for really we aim not to be funny so that the funny stuff has space to come out rather than people telling jokes um which if you'd have people telling jokes tends to stop the story because that's what jokes that's the function of a joke it's a punchline but there's a world of difference between a joke which is a setup and a designed mm. piece really um, mm. and character comedy yes so you, you don't say no to that no no the character fact, comedy that's, that's exactly what, you're what I'm saying, saying. Yeah. Yeah. which once again takes us back to proper musicals mm. rather than music hall because music hall might rely rather more on a, on a punchline but yeah. a musical is about if it's a comic one even if it's not if, but if, even if it's a lighter moment it's normally about character rather than anything else isn't it so yes you, I, what I suppose I'm drawing here is the fact that you are following a lot of the tropes of written musical theatre mm. in your improvisation which you'd expect because it is an homage almost in a way you know, Yes. Or an extension of the same genre. Are you the same genre? Or are you a reflection of it? I, I think you're right to say we would... I mean, it, it is a similar genre in terms of the fact that it's a story being supported by songs. Mm. Um, a lot of the songs are in a, a style that's recognisably musical theatre. 
Um, like you say, there's a lot of the, the, the comic, I suppose, the comic side of musical theatre, a lot of that's in there. Yesterday's show, as it happened, and it's the first time it's happened, was quite, we, obviously there was a parallel with The Little Mermaid. Yes. And um, <laughs> That wasn't intentional, I just like to point out. We saw halfway through and went, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, the story was different, but, but it made it easier for us to follow the genre because it's the, the very clear Disney genre, which is a, a strong hero, strong villain, and the, the villain is in the way of the it hero getting something. It was black and white yesterday. Yes. You know, there was a venal queen who yes. was shallow in the extreme and, yes. uh, and a slightly cross crab who I'm <laughs> called Boris, who I'm, look, I'm <laughs> sitting across the table to. <laughs> right um, yeah, so if, these, these were not characters I expect to meet in the street. No, yeah. no. Or even should I be swimming? <laughs> <laughs> But it was, it was nice to do uh, a show which was like that because we'd come off the back of having done quite a few shows where the characters were quite a lot more realistic. I think we'd done, we'd done one called The Bin Men, which was exactly <laughs> what you'd expect from a story, a story about bin men. And it's, some, it's nice when you get a different sort of genre. And musical yeah. theatre actually is very, very good at taking those sort of different genres and making them human. And I think that's the important thing. It's that, yeah. That's where the link comes from. It's the... Well, I, I mean, I do think of musical theatre as different from drama. And I used, mm. when I use the word straight drama, I'm only using it as an example, you know, a way of shorthanding non-musical yeah. theatre. Mm. But it's as broad as, because it is the same thing. It's all drama, essentially, just a different way of doing it. As you say, you can have, you know, Sweeney Todd is extremely different to them. Yes, the happy absolutely. Mo- uh, the, the little moment. <laughs> yes. Or yeah. Finding Nemo. Or, mm. yes, or pretty much anything, to be honest, or yeah. anything you used to see up here in Edinburgh. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. So... Can I ask a question about the relationship between you as performers and you as musicians? Mm. Because there's you and a young gentleman who plays a series of saxophones. I should say not yes. at the same time. <laughs> no, he's not that talented. <laughs> <laughs> there's only a limited number of orifices, if I may say, as well. So. <laughs> I don't know about you, I can't blow through my ears. But, <laughs> he said cleaning that up. But, um, but seriously, there is musical theatre when written you know um, a good musical theatre is where a song carries the plot forward it isn't just underlining what's been just mm. said that's a slightly older model of that but the author whether the, the, there's a composer and a, and a book author and they're different but, you know there comes a point of what's called the sort of nexus point where you think right this is where I can easily transition into a song how does one affect that both as performers and as musical directors do you as a performer take your cue from James who's standing at the keyboard or you James from the performers who have clearly led you up a garden path to a particular point where you <laughs> need to strike some chords or is it a lot more organic than that um, I think we kind of we bounce off each other for want of a less yeah. drama term bouncing off each other but um but yeah, because so sometimes um, James will vamp and take us into a song and we'll be like, okay, now we're going to do a song. And then you could, I think sometimes people come on stage like, well, it's song time now, I'm going to start singing, James will just have to follow. Yeah. Mm. But, then, um, but it also means he can sort of drop you in it a bit. Like once I ended up doing a whole song about Basingstoke, because I did a throwaway <laughs> line about Basingstoke, and James started vamping up the piano, and I did an entire song about Basingstoke. I've got to ask you this, do either of you know your Gilbert and Sullivan? Um, I don't think I've ever seen a Gilbert and Sullivan production. Out of my sight! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> I only mention, mm. for, I don't know if you know, the original version of Rudigore, Rudigore mm-hmm. yeah. uh, which was subsequently cut after the first night, finishes with a, uh, the, the entire finale as about moving to Basingstoke. Really? Yes, oh, there is. you go. So look, you are yeah. in the best musical <laughs> tradition. <laughs> I had no idea. I was thinking so. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's, it's 130 years in the making of your musicals. Yeah. I can see that. <laughs> no, it, it's interesting that that question because I'm, I'm because I'm both directing and musical directing. I suppose there is a sense that I I would see both myself and Stuart Court, who's playing the saxophone. Both of us are in a more of a position to behave like the audience I suppose yeah. so often when I'm playing I think to myself well what does the audience want to see or what do I want to see as the audience here and I, I, I'm really like I suppose how many did we have on yesterday 12 people I'm maybe the 13th improviser in terms of the fact that um, the cues that come from me are just as important as the cues that come from oh, the cast I would I would say absolutely mm. I think you know if you just as in written musicals you can't have a show well, you can't easily have a show without an orchestra or a band mm. it's absolutely true that you are as much part of the what's being presented the Public. I don't think any of us took you as anything other than no. being, you know, mm. uh, you and Stuart, did you say? Yes, Stuart, uh, yeah. You know, forgive me, are as integral as everyone else. Yeah, um, it's, And it's, also, you, there was underscoring as well, which mm. I, I rather liked. Mm. There were moments where it wasn't songs, but there was incidental music, for want of a better phrase. Um, you, you know, you, you can... 
yeah. you can set a tone and feel it. Mm. Yeah, I do think that's very helpful when he does the underscoring because you kind of it yeah it sets the atmosphere before anyone's even walked on. So it's sort of mm. like a bit of a clue as where it's going, sort of like to the audience as well as to us. To be like, okay, right, yeah, something it's like dark and horrible needs to happen now. It's like very happy needs to happen now. It's an exciting situation. And it works the other way as well, of course, because if somebody if a character comes on, then one of the first things I will try and do is to match the match the character with the music and. Um, and I suppose with musicals it's all about making things emotionally big yeah. and it's one of the tricks that we have, not that we have many tricks, but it's one of the tricks that you can use and film composers use all the time and, um, and musical theatre composers use is just to ramp things up a bit, especially because we're doing a full musical in less than an hour yes. uh, and it's important to get to the emotional points Some very emotional quickly. transitions are needed and they have mm. to be helped on their way, don't they? Absolutely, right. yeah. Well, you've mentioned the word tricks. Now, I'm going to raise the question <laughs> that everyone gets, but I know the answer mm. because, um, forgive me, I've also interviewed Dylan from Showstop. Oh yes, of course. And yeah, he's a, he's a lovely man, mm. um, and there's some, he's also doing a children's improvised musical yes. at the moment. And yeah. so there's some fantastic photographs of him wearing dungarees around the Edinburgh. Moment, <laughs> he looks I, lovely in the he dungarees. Does. Everyone yes. looks better in brightly coloured dungarees, <laughs> don't they? No. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> but, but people always say, and I heard someone in the audience uh, talking about this very thing. Actually, mm. this was in the queue waiting to go in yesterday into the surgeons' hall, uh, into the merchants' hall, which was. Um, don't they have a kind of formula of plot? So, you know, character X will come in after 10 minutes and character Y will come in after 20 minutes. And don't you have a series of stock songs which you just put new lyrics on? I know the answer is mm. no, it's absolutely not, because yeah. you, can't, you can't actually no. play it like that. Even if, I, I can't see that that would be actually possible to make that cohesive and good. But you'd give me your... You must get that question a lot. We do, don't we? Yeah, all so, the time. And I'll be honest, before I did it, I honestly thought there must be more to it than there is. As in, <laughs> as in like, don't undersell yourself. No, as, in you? like, as in, I thought there was more pre-planned things in the shows before like, than there actually is, because there's really not... A, no. It's a, it's a, you have to know how to tell a story, and you have to know that the... The, the ingredients of story I suppose but even then they can come in very very different ways you usually will have somebody that the audience identifies with some sort of protagonist you'll usually have something that's working against them which may be a character or maybe a force that's unseen but really all you need to know about story is that when you're starting it then you can have lots of ideas but when you want to end the story you just have to bring ideas back rather than thinking of new ones and that really is the that's the only it's the secret of writing as it well is, as the yeah. secret of, of of improvising and once you have that kind of structure that it's ideas at the beginning and then bringing things back yeah. at the end then most stories will find their way to an end the, as you say the simplest narrative structure whether it be musical or drama or, or novel or whatever mm. is main plot subplot mm. intertwine intertwined conclusion is where one is affected by the other hopefully to a satisfactory ending mm. positively happy or not but um, <laughs> but one has affected the other Yes, um, absolutely. And so, but, but that's not a trick of musical theatre or no. a trick of improvised musical theatre. That's just how drama works, isn't it? So. Well, it's innate in everybody. Everyone's told stories from an early age. And one of the things that I've found when I've been teaching music, uh, improvised musicals is that you actually have to teach a lot less than you think because most of the stuff you're telling people is already in the back of your heads. And actually, if you try and tell them it, it confuses matters because yeah. it's an innate thing. People know how stories work. And you have to be very careful about what you actually are teaching improvisers to do because otherwise you'll confuse them, overload them and then you end up, you will end up with pre-packaged plots and, and things that happen again and again and again. Which would be boring for you as performers as well, would it not? If it, if, yeah. If, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes, if you signed up for that, you'd do mm. legitimate theatre in that sense, yeah. you? which would be 40 nights shouting in the theatre. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about the nature of conclusions because, as you say, if so much of the satisfaction factory feeling of a good story is that it has concluded mm. well how difficult is that for you to achieve particularly in these constrained times you know you, as mm. you say you're there for an hour essentially how do you do it I mean, and, and is I mean, this is a question I've asked another improv group so I'd be very yeah. interested to hear your answer is having a good song at the end because all musicals end with a song mm. better than having a satisfactory conclusion and having a slightly weaker song discuss Ooh. And, sh Ooh. and show your working <laughs> <laughs> I would say, with us personally, we tend to go for a more satisfactory ending and you just have to trust that something will come back. Because even if you can't, because quite often I am like, how on earth are they going to solve this? And someone will come in with something I'd completely forgotten in the beginning, but it was actually like the key to solving it all. And, I and that's really satisfying. Isn't yeah, it? I would personally think that's better than then having a... Obviously, it's nice to have a big ending song as well, yeah. but I feel like the audience feels more cheated if they get a bad story they rather do, than yes. if they mm. had a bad, a, a weaker song. Yeah. 
it's, it's once again it's back to cohesiveness isn't mm. it yeah. Um, and I think we've all seen musicals where actually we've enjoyed the story, but the, the score has been a bit weak, mm. I must say. So I'm not saying that is the case, but, <laughs> but I just wonder what is the priority for you both. It's. Uh, it would definitely, from my point of view, would definitely be the story again. I think that. But that, that's. I suppose that's. That's why it's so nice to have so many different improvised musicals up here because different. Uh, troops and companies will have different things that they feel strongly about. But for us, we, a lot of us are storytellers in terms of our background, um, whether we're writers or storytellers or stand-up comedians or it's people who tell stories. Um, and to me, that's more important. In terms of the songs, we, we, yeah, I think it's important to have some good songs that people will go away and remember after the, after the yeah. show. But actually, the story would be the, the big priority, I think, definitely. Well, let's talk about your... I'm not going to use the word gimmick, I'm going to use the word hook. Mm. Because every improv group seems to have a different hook. As you said, we will discuss showstoppers. Mm. Yours is going down the audience line and queue before uh, going in, asking people to write a word or a phrase or some little epithet on a piece of paper, mm. putting it in a hat, which is then drawn from, shall we say, in the uh, by you, James, yes, at, yeah. uh, at the piano, um, as though you're overseeing a review of this. Because when we, yeah. we, we... Yesterday, for example, as we were being seated... Uh, one of the performers was singing a song which I believe was pulled from the hat That's that, right, that part yes. already happened and then you pulled another song from a hat and two more performers sang that song mm. uh, which was being on a it was, it was supposed to be an extract of one song from a musical the title which had also been pulled from yes, the hat which right. I think was something about going into space it was that's a space right. exploration yeah. thing and yet the Look. song was about standing on a bridge yes. but actually they, they, a way was found to make the mm. two connect absolutely I mean, it was a romantic song of goodbye mm. and then a man leaves the bridge before he's going off in his rocket it was a yeah. romantic <laughs> just like stand on the bridge then straight into the mission control yeah. that's how it works and, yeah. then, and then you pulled uh, three quotations if you like mm. one better phrase from the hat put them to the public vote which was the most popular and yesterday's was called and I know this because I was the one who put it in so I'm very proud <laughs> of this you? Yeah, it, it was um, what I lack in depth I make up for in shallowness That's which it. is a quotation actually from the Adams Family musical which is up here at the moment <laughs> really? so oh, wow. you at least know you are the sequel hooray yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I like that as, as, a, as a hook has that thrown up anything unusual or strange or particularly memorable or particularly difficult for you? There must be clever clogs out there who have uh, confounded you. you. I mean, the thing with that is that um, the songs at the beginning are fine. We, we, yeah. we, we came on with that idea quite, quite late on because we realised that when people are coming in, it's nice to, for them to have the show already there. Yeah. And especially because sometimes with the, you know, it can be quite slow getting in into quite a small venue. It's also a lovely way of warming up. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And, that's, and that's one of the other reasons uh, that we did that there. Um, in terms of the, the composer and lyricist, that was just... It was just <laughs> oh, a, yes, you pick names from yeah, the Yeah, I pick audience. names from the audience. And it's a, it's a bit of fun to, to help help the audience feel involved but also for me the most important thing is that the audience get a show which they're happy with and we do occasionally get things sometimes I'll get something which is um, which is perhaps too rude to yes. because we're a 12 plus audience but even then some people it's will naughty but it's not as naughty as all that yeah. no exactly and so I, sometimes we will just you know there's ways of get, getting around that um, we haven't because we ask the audience to choose from three I would always trust the audience to, yeah. to pick something that they want to see we have had a couple of times when I think there was one which was something to do with the Scottish country dancing Latvian or something like that which was one of the three options and had it been picked we would have done it but um, it you would have been unhappy a, but it wasn't <laughs> I wasn't unhappy that it wasn't because it would have been it would have been you can still write a story about it of course but it would have been a, a more it would have been starting from a gimmick and it would have been more difficult to get out of and actually generally the audience um, are very good at choosing what they want to see um, so I think it's worked quite nicely for us the choice of three is definitely something that's important because it makes me feel like the audience will know that we're not just selecting you know, from uh, from a, a range of a bank of musicals we've already yeah, done, yeah. and it also means that the audience feel that, that, that it's something that they have chosen that they want, which is important because that's what we're there to do—to tell a story that the audience wants to tell. Any particularly memorable musicals or song titles you can recall? Um, my kilt is on fire. That was one. <laughs> Hair raising. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> that we did that musical a few days ago. We did. Uh, what other ones have we done? Uh, what else have we done? Um, but sometimes you get really obscure ones that we had albatross. So it was just one word, and yeah. I was a bit like, ooh, okay. Because it's, it's quite, I don't know if it's more difficult or not. When there's only a one word title, mm. I feel like, I don't know. There's almost more you can do with it. So Because you're like, well, where does it fit in? Whereas like, Mel Kilt was on fire, can only mean one thing. Was Samuel Coleridge Sailor rolling in his grave, or was he untouched by your albatross story, would you say? Oh, I'm no. thinking of the rhyme of the ancient mariner, which is oh, the only albatross uh, connection I was, have. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was really untouched, unless, <laughs> we, accident, unless we accidentally slipped into it. <laughs> yeah. It's quite possible, isn't it? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> it's out of copyright, so it doesn't matter. Yes. So, 
what is the future for Baron Sternlock? Baron Sternlock, bike lock, whatever. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I like that Baron bike lock. That's nice. Um, <laughs> it's it's um, hopefully it's something that's going to continue. I mean, I, I think by the nature of it, a lot of the cast uh, are, were part of University of Birmingham this yes. year. Um, and a lot of them are graduating and, and going off and working in different places. So the plan at the moment is the to real continue world it. Is Absolutely, on the door, Ooh, yeah. And we're unhappy yes. about it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it, it's something that will continue. I don't know what form in yet, um, but hopefully it will always be something that is open to anybody that wants to give it a go. Whether it comes to Edinburgh again in the future, well, I hope so. Um, but, but to me, it's most important that it's something where people can get the performance experience straight away and. Um, and have a lot of fun and enjoy it and realise that actually improvising musicals is a fun thing to do and it's not as scary as people think it is, I think. And therefore, <laughs> for those of you who are leaving university, yes. is improvising in any form, whether it be musical or otherwise, likely to hang around? Well, I would love to continue doing it because it's the most fun and it gives you an excuse to just go up on stage and sort of mess about and be silly and be entertaining. So maybe it's also partially an arrogance thing. I just like being laughed at. And then, um, but I really enjoy it. I know a lot of people, they're almost quite upset that we have to leave because like, yeah. most of us aren't living in Birmingham next year. No. So unless I wanted to commute from Birmingham to London every Wednesday evening to do rehearsals, <laughs> it would be quite difficult. But I know a lot of people want to definitely carry on and want to find something else that's improvised based because we just all really enjoy it. Most of us have done it in some shape or form for the all three years that we've been at uni and this has been like a nice sort of ending to it all at uni. This is yeah. a cherry on the bake or tart of your life. Is it? Oh, it's definitely. There's a song title there. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome to it, honestly. Yeah. Do you have a website? Yes, it's www.baronsternlook.com. Yeah. Oh, well, I wish you great success. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for talking to Musical Talk. I, have, I wish you great success both remaining in university and beyond university. <laughs> and um, I do hope that Baron Sternlock does make a return visit to Edinburgh and beyond. Thank yes. you very much. Thank, thank you very you much. much. I will owe you for this favour. Yes, you will. <coughs> Just think, <laughs> very soon we shall inspect that beautiful mouth of hers. <laughs> yes, once again you will be with your love. The woman you love, you would not understand. To be with someone you love, knowing that God has planned the moment that you and she are together.
beautiful, but there's only one I choose. Yet you have taken a holy vow, whichever way you look at it, you lose. How can I survive without the thing that is dearest to my heart? My advice to you, my brother, don't even start! <laughs> Keith, um, and I am the director of the Oxford Imps and specifically this show is the curious case of the improvised musical of which I am co-directing it uh, with a friend of mine uh, who has sort of more musical theatre experience than I do but I've sort of come from the sort of improv background side of it. Well let's start there then. Improvised musicals are usually a mixture of comedy and improvised song, obviously. Can I ask you a question? This might seem a bit offbeat to start, bearing in mind you've just presented me with a very funny musical comedy. Do you think it's ever possible to do a straight improvised musical? Because, or, or does the comedy really... Is that absolutely needed in order to smooth over the edges? Uh, so I think it is possible. I think uh, that Showstoppers, a company I'm sure you're oh, aware of, I, I believe they do sometimes do straight musicals where just because of the nature of their suggestions it turns out to be quite a serious show rather than a comedy. I think that from my personal perspective I like the comedy element of it and I think that there is a, a degree to which you could ask the question of if it's not funny then why don't you just go and watch a regular musical that will be sort of tighter written and have a larger cast and big dance numbers and you know be more of a spectacle. So the comedy's first, really? For us, it definitely is, yes. I, I think that's fairly standard. I, I've seen one or two, well, I've seen quite a few, in fairness. But uh, generally, I've been asking everyone that question because I'm genuinely interested to find out how much the comedy and the music merge. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about this particular show. Not today's show, although that we'll use that to inform our discussion, I have no doubt. You're an improv group in the first instance, and you've branched out into, into musical theatre improv, I think. Yes. How was that step taken? Because it seems to me quite a leap. So... In our, our regular show, uh, which is this year entitled Pun and Games. Good title. Thank you. Um, we do certain games in that, our musical. Um, so our improvisers, um, when they are sort of training and in the regular show, they do learn how to improvise songs. So it's just putting a bit more effort into really refining that. For us, every year we put on a long form so an hour-long show with some kind of uh, genre usually so two years ago it was an improvised Shakespeare play that we did um, and this year it happened to be the early genesis of this show and we as a company are made up of a mixture of Oxford University students Oxford Brooks students and just local Oxford residents so the, the magic <coughs> one here is Oxford yes yes uh, I saw for, that. for <laughs> geographical uh, con convenience uh, we Perform during sort of university term time. We get a lot of students coming to our shows, and in order to, in, in the middle Oxford term, we put on a week of long forms. It just so happened that this year we looked at the cast, and um, my director, my co-director, and I sat down and decided that we wanted to, to particularly look at musicals. We thought that we had a strong cast to do that this year. I, so I particularly also wanted to do something in the sort of murder mystery genre 
Uh, we sort of toyed with Sherlock Holmes or, or whether we do like a Dickens type thing. But we ended up settling on, on having Agatha Christie as our sort of host figure for the show. Um, which we thought would be nice and, and a nice way to get audience members sort of involved as well with us sort of being very silly and pretending to be an 123-year-old woman. It must be said, actually, that's one of the things that marks out your improvised musical over some of the others. Everyone's got their particular twist and style and I love the fact that you have... It's not just an improvised musical, it's an improvised mur- musical murder mystery, as you say, hosted by Agatha Christie. That's two very different constraints, really. You know, a murder mystery has its, its tropes... And you follow those nicely, you know, you, you perform it as a two-act piece, or you certainly did today, where act one is where the murder occurs at the end of, and then there's a certain amount of questioning by the audience, or oh, that was an interesting idea, uh, audience questioning the, uh, the cast members. And then act two takes us to the, to the point where resolution is required, and then the audience picks who the, the murderer actually is. But that has its, its tropes and forms. Musical theatre has its tropes and forms. Do you ever find there's a clash? Um, and if so, who, who is paramount? <laughs> Not so much a clash, but um, within our time constraints of, of you know, we, we have an, an hour-long slot. We have to get our show in, set up, do the show, and then pack everyone out the again. The five minutes in, the five minutes out. Exactly. Yeah. So we only actually have 50 minutes, really, to do the show. Uh, 45 if there's been a delay. So the issue then is... Have we done enough songs? Have we done too many songs? Does everyone have a clear motive? Um, have we all sort of implicated ourselves enough? Have we had enough arguments? Has someone been upset about the murder yet? Um, have we sort of varied the tone within each of the songs and also within each of the scenes enough? So it's it's a struggle to try and fit tropes of both genres in within our time period. Of course. But that is also part of the, the fun of it. It's sort of really pushing yourself... The, the one thing I love about all improvised musicals, or certainly the successful ones, are that obviously the people on the stage are so thoroughly enjoying themselves. And um, it was lovely today to watch you when you weren't actually performing in the scene, but on the side watching, laughing. And there were some fantastic moments. And then um, also finding those moments when you can sort of join in and add colour to the background. I mean, for example, today, almost entirely randomly, you and a, a fellow colleague were, were spitting llamas, doing a little dance in the background in response to a rather fanciful imagination about uh, an actress and the kind of show that she, uh, well, it was being suggested she might want it to put on by her fiancé. Yes. Um, so good luck with that, by the way. It's very lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the beautiful things about improv is that the audience sort of enter into a contract at the beginning of the show that what they see will not necessarily be as polished as a pre-written show but there will be moments like that that you just can't explain to someone that wasn't at the show yes. and you try and explain it and it sounds really naff but in the moment um, it where it's created uh, so that every scene is born and dies in the same moment and there's some uh, an amazing energy within the room where that audience that we had today are the only people on this entire planet that will ever see that exact scene and, and feel that exact laugh I feel very privileged, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. So it's it's a strange one, and in a world where um, you know television and, and film are sort of outpacing uh, theatre and live performance, I think improv is a very interesting genre because you get um, something is lost when you watch it on television. Oh, indeed, yes. Which is why there aren't that many improv shows on television anymore. They've sort of they had their day in the nineties, really. And yes. Came off the box again. There's also the, the fact that um, if you're going to make a television programme based around improv, uh, you actually have to record for about four hours if you want an hour-long show, which is just, just very time-consuming. And expensive for the, uh, the studio. Absolutely, yeah, right. absolutely. Now, can I ask you a question? Now, you said something right at the beginning. You said you are the director or co-director yes. of this show. Now, someone's going to say, and it's going to be me, how can one, I know the answer, by the way, but I still want to hear it, how can one be a director of an improvised musical if it's truly improvised? Some smart aleck will it's, say that. It's, <laughs> it's true, and, and to be, the, the, the word director is somewhat misleading. Really, I'm more you of a... You don't wear the jodhpurs? I, I don't. Uh, I don't have a little seat. And I don't smoke cigars or anything like that. <laughs> but I, um, I'm more of a sort of workshop facilitator, yeah. if that makes sense. I sort of lead the warm-ups and make sure that everyone's sort of physically and vocally warmed up. And we've done sort of mental warm-ups as well to get people thinking about rhyming and thinking about sort of plot structure and thinking about the genre before they go on stage and then in rehearsals we you know do run-throughs of the show and then um either myself or, or i allocate someone else to to make notes on the on the run-throughs that we have it's nice because an improvised show is a uh, team sports by its very nature 
So you have to open up a discussion with the improvisers because uh, I can have a vision as clear in my own head as I like, but I cannot control what someone else is going to improvise yeah. on the stage you know, when I'm not there doing it myself. Well, that, that actually came across today because it was a, a slight comedic moment where it wasn't quite certain which century we're in. No. Because uh, it felt to me like we'd started uh, back two or three centuries, or four centuries possibly, and quite then suddenly became much more present day, or at least telegrams. So, uh, yes. But uh, that added to the charm of it, I must say. Thank you. You mentioned rhymes as well. I mean, let's talk about the musical aspect of this. A, a, a song is simply words and uh, music. So you were talking about keeping the mind in tune and getting it to a pitch where you're thinking in a way that you can improvise a song and that will involve at least some idea of rhyming in the broadest sense and I'm going to give you the prize for today's best rhyme when you rhymed America with betterer. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I almost fell off my seat with delight at that. It was splendid. But forgive me, what are the methods by which you and your colleagues can sort of keep yourself at fever pitch? Because um, the other people I've spoken to always say that the secret to being a good improviser is to continue to improvise. It's, you know, it's difficult to do it from cold. You have to do it day in, day out, more than once perhaps. Um, and you can't just sort of take a week off and come back and expect to be able to do it again. Um, so we're very lucky that we've got our regular show, which is on every afternoon. So before we started this run on Sunday, uh, we'd already, or the majority of us as a, as a cast, had already been up in Edinburgh improvising a show every day yeah. um, for two weeks. Um, so you're pretty much at the level, weren't you, already? Well, it's, it's, it's a nice warm-up to have. But then we just do a lot of rehearsing, and um, we have a, a residency at a pub in Oxford uh, where we do 24 shows a year that coincide with the Oxford University term times. During term time, we also rehearse for three hours a week. Um, new members have to rehearse uh, for an extra three hours a week, so they yeah. do effectively... That's their apprenticeship. Yeah, six hours of rehearsals, and then they have to come and watch the shows as well yeah. um, to get oh, a feel a, for how it works. I know, yeah. I know. It is a tough life. but uh, So it's just a, a sense of sort of attrition, really. The more you do it, the better you get, um, and there will be sort of hurdles that you have to overcome as a personal, uh, you know, on a personal level. Yeah, we, we're very lucky in our cast. We've got some people that are just very good singers, people that have done a lot of musical theatre, or we've, uh, you know, we have professional stand-ups working within the, the company. But you know, there'll be other things they're not so good at. So that's interesting. You've got some people who are more naturally singery, shall we say? Using yeah. a new word. Yeah. I've, I've, I've just come in. I feel I rather like. And you've got people who are more naturally comedic. Yes. Um, and so by having some kind of fusion of the two, that's how you can really make this. Because it's, some groups don't do that, and some groups do. So that, that's very interesting to me. That that's the, the approach, which allows different people to shine at different moments. Because you are doing more than one thing. It's not just a musical. It's a it's a comedy. It's also a murder mystery of sorts. But what about improvising songs? Is you know is is there a technique within the wider world of improvising that helps one move to that direction? Because there is, I'm, I mean, when I use rhyming, I'm talking about broad rhyming. Mm. Not every song has to rhyme, of course, no. it doesn't. But there is a sort of expectation that a song might rhyme, uh, and so presumably you have to make some effort in that direction. So there are lots of rhyming exercises that uh, you can do in order to get people sort of thinking about rhymes. We have had um, a few dedicated rehearsals where we've sat and listened to songs from musicals um, and different styles of, of songs. And we, <laughs> one of the things we've come away with is actually how few rhymes there are yes. in a lot of really great songs. Unless you're song time, when you put them all in the middle. Yes, uh, yes. That's it, you know, listening to professional, uh, you know, for listening to musicals um, there are rhyming exercises you can do and then on top of that it's just sort of getting up and, and having a go and we've had you know quite a lot of intensive rehearsals before we started this run where we just do sort of back to back um, you know to improvise a scene and then at some point go into a song and then we'll do it again and again and again and eventually the songs hopefully start to sound quite tuneful and interesting coherent yeah, yeah a coherent so and at the beginning you said that you are not per se a musical theatre fan or you know, that's not how you got you're more on the improvs and that there are others who know more about musical theatre but obviously a song is also about the music and saying we're an improvisational group and now we want someone to help us improvise music under the songs that we're going to create. How easy was it for you to find people who had that skill? Because, you know, there are a lot of very great musicians in the world who can't improvise for, for love nor money. I mean, you probably know the um, Stefan Grappelli and Yehudi Menuhin. Yes. He did an awful lot of um, duets together towards the end of their lives. But Stefan Grappelli could, um, could do jazz and Yehudi Menuhin couldn't. And so that everything was cleverly orchestrated for them with bit parts where... Uh, Stefan Capelli could improvise but when they did things live on television 
it was quite it was interesting to watch a hoodie menu and have to take a back seat because he couldn't join in with the more improvised parts. So mm. He physically saw that problem. Well, they created a beautiful result. How did you find your um, Stefan Grappelli's rather than your, your hoodie menu ends? Um, so we have, um, within our show, we are accompanied by a pianist um, anyway. Um, so every year we hold auditions. Uh, this is in your non music Yeah, in our, in our regular sort of improvised yeah. sketch show. We have a, a pianist there. And so this year we've had um, three pianists um, who sort of rotate um, shows and, and come and accompany us. And so we just have two of them. And uh, luckily they both play multiple instruments. Oh. So between the two of them that are up with us, right at the minute uh, they both obviously play um, sort of keyboard piano one plays the guitar one plays the accordion we so one of our stage uh, improvisers uh, who is a an excellent improviser and sort of sketch writer also just happens to play the cajon um, I don't even know what that is the cajon is, is the the, uh, the percussion that we had today oh. um, the, the music box uh, that he sits on and taps his uh, father is a music producer and he had sort of lots of drum lessons as a child and it just happened to mention it um, when we were talking to him in the pub once and we thought well yeah bring it along see what happens and um, we really like it and today of course one of the, ca- the, the actress character in the, in the improvised show had a wooden leg which she was using as the basis of her act. Yes. She percussively bashed her own leg as her act. I um, think that's very funny. Yeah, there's a lot of nice stuff you can do when you know what the um, musicians are capable of and of course they should be as in tune with us as we are with each other. So you can sort of pimp them to do stuff from the sides. <laughs> that's an official term, isn't that it? Is, that, is a, that is actually an official yeah. term. So we, we can, you know, Lots of things like if, if someone's knocking on a door, you just make sure that you look at the, the guy on percussion and, and you know, make it very obvious and he will um, make a much better sound than we ever could. And similarly, we're, we're, sort of, we were having a discussion about this the other day actually, so sort of how many more sort of things can we try and get them to do almost as Foley artists rather than just as, uh, as, as musicians? Yeah, and then the, the trumpet player that we've got as well, um, we auditioned at the beginning of the year because we were looking to maybe bring other instruments in. Knowing it's a richer sound as well, doesn't it? We really like it. Um, and you can do some great sort of jazz numbers or we um, with the guitar and the, and the trumpet, you can have some very sort of fiery sort of uh, Spanish sounding songs, uh, which go very well for sort of, you know, crossed lovers and yeah. things like that. The passion. Exactly, exactly. So what is the birth of a song in an improvised musical? Is it, and um, once again, I suspect there's more than one answer, so feel free, but um, they come, you know, in, if you were writing a musical, you would put the song where the next point is, where something dramatic is happening and you need to take it further and perhaps the emotion is uh, underscored more strongly than it would be in just uh, dialogue. When you're improvising, do you as improvisers on the stage think, oh, this is a song I hope they realise, you know, um, and start singing and wait for them to catch up? And are there occasions, presumably, when the orchestra think, right, this feels like a good point for a song, I'm going to make the bugger sing? Uh, yep, the band definitely starts sort of vamping and then sort of, you know, less and less subtly um, they try and get us to start singing a song when they feel that, you know, one is required. Um, sometimes you can just start singing without any underscoring going on yeah. at all and then they'll join in. Acapella verse. Yeah, there's a, a nice idea that you have to earn the right to sing. Um, so there sh- you in the song you shouldn't really introduce any major plot points or any new information um, it should however add a lot more sort of tone and emotion to what has already been stated yeah. so within the beginning of your scene you should probably establish who you are where you are what you're doing there um, and if you happen to mention some reason why you'd want someone dead then the, the musicians may start playing and then you can sort of soliloquize through song uh, about you know exactly how you hated them since childhood or whatever yes. it is so it's and also, I, I really like the idea that the music comes in in order to break up what would otherwise be a very sort of speaky show. As detective novels are, in fact. Yes, you know, they yes. They are very, very wordy. And it's, whereas and a, a play of a, a detective novel is often that way. They, you know, they quite often end with a drawing room scene where, where the detective unravels what's going on, but very difficult to film and presumably also... As you can, as you say, possibly a little dull to stay. So we, we really, especially with today, so the show that you've seen, um, we are sort of marketing it as a family show yeah. um, that you know, children should enjoy just as much as parents. We had children in the audience who were, they were. There was a lovely, sorry, I'm interrupting you there. There was a lovely scene earlier on where um, Gideon, who's the first mate, has a brief flirtation scene with the actress, uh, who, and they're of different classes. And the scene just, um, they're so infatuated with each other, they can't speak, so they're all going, mm! Yeah. That, that went on and on and on, but for comic effect, it built up. It didn't go on and on in a dreadful way. It came on, and the children were adoring it. I'm really pleased uh, to hear that. 
so with that in mind, we wanted to get away from uh, the show being entirely sort of spoken and you know, music helps us to do that. You sort of mentioned earlier that we do have some audience interaction where at the end of the act one, you know, everyone gets questioned by the audience and we sort of field questions in a bit of a question and answer session. And then at the end, um, we particularly uh, want to get up a sort of a child uh, to come and, and point the literal finger um, at whoever they thought the murder <laughs> was and then whoever they pick, we justify in the very end. Yes. Uh, a, a, qu- After a, fashion, yes. a, a quick, a quick song or confession to music that will, um, you know, justify whatever decision they made. And yet, proper clues are laid down. I mean, I, if it had been a, a more written piece, um, one of the characters had a wooden leg. Yes. And um, she mentioned uh, the murder weapon was a clog, which had been made especially for her, and she said that she'd taken it off because it was too tight. And I thought, there's a clip. Someone's been clever, and they've managed to improvise a very good, um, you know, mistake. But that was, but the five-year-old didn't notice. Yeah, yeah. But that's part of the joy. We yeah. we are all there trying to implicate ourselves in yes. some kind of way. Yeah. So we're all sort of laying down clues as to why it was us or why it was someone else on stage. Uh, and then it is, you know, pot luck as yeah. to which one of us it actually ends up being. How do you pick the victim, by the way? Because today you were the very gallant victim. You were murdered at the end of Act One. Did you? you know, is it whoever decides to drop to the floor first? Pretty much. So it could have um, been anyone. It could have been you on stage. Uh, you should always be thinking who would it make most sense for i.e. who has uh, had arguments with the most uh, you know uh, of the other characters or who by getting rid of them would actually make the other stories work exactly exactly so I sort of felt today that um, I'd had arguments with a couple of the of the other characters I had sort of s- secrets that I, I didn't want them to tell and they about me the same so um, there was sort of a lot of potential there for, for you know, a murder um, and then also uh, as I was dying I tried to, to give a bit of a, a clue as to why another character may also want me dead and your accents today because you were playing two different characters you were Dutch I was Dutch a lot of sh- uh, Shibble and Cheshire yes which, um, very, yeah. uh, 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 very, uh, very Sean Connery <laughs> yeah it was a bit yeah and American in the second act yes I mean that's one of the we've got a lot of very talented sort of voice artists in the company um, and I think that this show in particular really lends itself to you coming on with these kind of uh, caricatures it's got really. to be shorthand isn't it because you've got so little time it's, it, they aren't really character pieces are they it's, yeah. it's a comedy piece first I mean just for the record as you say it's an ephemeral piece it'll never be seen again would you care to sum up today's plot in a couple of minutes good well, luck by the way well <laughs> there was there was a murder aboard the, the great ship success um, the, a, Dutch ship, the, a, a Dutch ship, or at least uh, captained by a Dutchman. Captain Henry uh, was murdered, and it later transpired that he was murdered by the cook uh, with whom he'd argued previously and who secretly loved him, but he never appreciated anything that she ever did, especially not his fish soup. Um, there was a lot of sort of complicated sort of love um, triangles, uh, I think plural. Almost everyone seemed to... Um, yes, uh, particularly, so the captain wanted to to marry a woman but his cousin also wanted to marry the woman and then the first mate also wanted to marry the same woman and then that was the actress the actress uh the actress of course and then but later a former flame for the captain also came back and sort of implied that uh that now that uh Oh, that she because of because of the, the previous um, liaison, she would not wish to be on the same ship with him were he alive. So it's convenient that he's dead. Um, yes, uh, I think that's, that sums it up fairly well. Yeah, just with music. Yeah, <laughs> yes, with songs. Splendid. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I wish you great success. Thank you. Now, you personally, yes. Tom, are a student at Oxford at the moment. I am. Which year are you in? Uh, I've just finished my second year. I'm going to my third year. Finals for you in this year? Um, I'm actually a language student, so oh, I'm, I'm off, off for a year abroad in Vienna. Oh, jolly good. Well, yes. That gives us a clue as to which language you're learning. Yes, it does, <laughs> yeah. So, um, forgive me, does that, um, how does the group work? Because it must have people who come and go and, you know, will you be here next year? Or is um, it a year after even? I plan to be up at the fringe with the company next year um, and then to rejoin the in Oxford and then uh, sort of see what happens after my degree finishes um, but the nature of us is that um, we've been going for 10 years as a company the Oxford Olympics, and we have had I think about 150 different members now 
um, 145. Um, so the, the company is changing and sort of once every three years, there's almost sort of a complete ch uh, generational, you know, change. generational change. But that's very nice because we are essentially sort of a training company um, and you know we've got you know very nicely for us now um, you look at a lot of shows at the Pleasants and things and you sort of see oh yeah they were in the company five years ago or they directed back in you know, 2010 or whatever it is when I say you're a birthing house I mean that in, in a way that's meant much nicer than it sounds no I think that's a great compliment um, we'll take that well thank you very much indeed uh, uh, absolutely top notch show I enjoyed it immensely so thank you for talking to me and uh, all power to your elbow for the future brilliant thank you very much oh, uh, first uh, first half closer <coughs> ok so I'll give you um, your character groupings so we're going to have it uh, Adam and Julie uh, you guys since you were together in that one you are um, uh, you're, in, you're both involved in the, uh, in the big exhibition the great exhibition um, and you've got an incredible machine which Adam wants to build and it will change everything. Um, you've got, who are you, Ruth? You were with Pippa, is that right? Yeah. yeah, you're the flower sellers outside the exhibition. Boom! Yeah, and then Lucy and Oliver, uh, you're the baddies. You're, I know, you're the owner of the exhibition and you're just not sure about this machine thing. And Lucy, you just love him. And Shorty. <laughs> Sean's oh, Sean's there. Sean is, oh. Sean is with the flower girls. Yeah, Sean is, just, is, is a, a, a vagrant. Is it Dick Van Dyke? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Got it. Okay. Samantha, look. With one flick of that lever, we will change the atmospheric pressure over Earth, and it will never rain again. Oh, Jeffrey, nothing but cloudless skies. Do you really think it's possible? I know it's possible. I dreamed it. See it. We're going to share it. With one flick of the switch, things will change. Look up to the sky, there's a brighter future.
um, thank you very much. I've just seen the improv musical. <laughs> <laughs> Look, after a show and you've still got energy. Well done. <laughs> thank you very much. Now, I, I'd like to speak to various people, but tell me, who are you in uh, relation to this show? I am AJ King. I'm the director of the improv musical, uh, which is less of an oxymoron than it would sound. Uh, well, you're not alone up here with uh, improvised musicals, are you? No, no, we're not. We're uh, one of many. Uh, however, we are a student-based production from the University of Warwick. How good of you uh, to anticipate my next question? <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me more. How, you know, forgive me, as, a, as a, an improv group, how do, what I'm always interested in is how does a, a group of people who are involved in improvisation then take it to the next level, which is musical theatre? Because it seems like you're doing something very difficult. It's, decided, it's, like, it's like walking on a tightrope on stilts. I don't want know why you've chosen to take that extra step. Ah, well, you see, most musical improv groups are a group of people doing improv, so on the tightrope first. However, we all come from a musical background. Oh, so we were on stilts and thought, what's different about stilts? We'll put them on a tightrope. Mm -hmm. So we've done it a little bit different to everybody else. So you're a musical uh, group first? We yeah. were a musical oh. theatre company first, and a couple of years ago at the Arts Festival at our uni, uh, our previous director, God rest his soul. Uh, <laughs> he's not actually dead. He's still alive. Uh, <laughs> he, he came up with a bizarre idea that we should attempt to do this and got seven people together, and uh, we decided to all make fools of ourselves on stage in front of everyone. And when we realized that we weren't terrible at it. Uh, <laughs> and you're certainly not terrible at it. Thank you for you're, saying so. Let me go one further. You're actually very good. <laughs> And you heard it from the man in charge <laughs> and not from one of us. Uh, yes, uh, we've uh, decided that we would carry on doing it, have formed a group. Because we're a uni group, we've lost people and cycled yeah. through people. So there's um, a generational thing. As you there know. is a serious generational thing. Uh, a lot of tonight's performance are from what we like to call the fourth generation of the improv musical. And they are our latest generation. In fact, actually, today is sort of our newest cast combination I think ever oh, we've really? got five people uh, five of the six people who joined us on stage this evening have only been doing this for four months at this point with the wonderful Jim Burrows here hello <laughs> <laughs> who played a penguin this evening yes it's that ridiculous come and see us he's been doing it now for a year uh, so lots of different time frame you don't believe in the method I'm assuming I have absolutely no <laughs> idea what the method is um, <laughs> actually living the part first uh, living the dream living the dream uh, <laughs> yeah. how does a penguin I'm guessing. Um, weekends occasionally. <laughs> see where the mood takes Those me. Parties, yeah. Oh, yeah, let's not talk about that. Not on, this is a family-friendly show, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it was. <laughs> so, um, you've decided that from musical theatre you wanted to step into. Imp why? I mean, that is. Is it just for the challenge of it? And uh, and can I ask what? And this is really an open question. What is it about your musical theatre background that? gives you the ability to then, because there's, uh, forgive me, there's a world of difference between performing musical theatre and creating it, and there's a world of difference between creating it and creating it on the spot. That's fair. What gave us the leap? I think it was probably a combination initially that the group of people that started this up uh, were disruptive and awful elements in real rehearsals who would never ever learn a script. And so we decided we were fed up of being yelled at by a director because we couldn't learn a script and thought, we can probably make it up of an evening. And that felt sort of like a dare. And between six of us all egging ourselves on, it became something more. But I mean, as a musical, it has a contemporary feel because obviously you're creating music on the spot. So you're, you know, I'm not going to walk away from the Today Show thinking, oh, that had feelings of Gilbert and Sullivan and Cole Porter. So, but, but you know, and the modern musical is its own thing. Are you actively trying to? Right. I suppose what? Well, I suppose my question is, and I'm stumbling towards it, is what is your tone? I would have said comic, and then from the comic, does that take you further, or do you see it as musical first with comedy on top? Um, so your yeah, name, please? I'm Alex. I'm the, the pianist. And you were doing wonderful things on the keyboard. Uh, I, Most well, of the music. That's your opinion, yeah. Um, so I think, so if we had an overall tone, I would agree that it's comic. We do sort of tend to sort of fall into a sort of, I mean, you, you, I don't want to spoil the ending, but it probably will be happy. Uh, just, a, just a warning. Um, although there is a part of the show, a very exciting part and terrifying part, where we ask for a uh, type, uh, style of song from the audience. So we've had. Oh, what we had? We had reggae, um, rap, hip hop, rap opera, tonight. rap battle tonight. Yeah. Uh, what else have we had? Um, electro funk. A man shouted today. We had a, a barber shop quartet. Oh yeah, that was quite terrifying. Um, <laughs> opera, opera really? is a big yeah. one. Yeah, we yeah. did an really? opera. We it did. Is. We do um, mile performances um, often on on the mile on the stages. And uh, today they asked us to do a song in an operatic style about a bunny. And Fluffy bunnies, yeah, it, it happened. We've had opera about cheese before yeah, we as did well. Opera we had to do Bree the opera. You had to do that opera. carefully, don't you? Join the troop. 
But yeah, no, it's it's, it's really good fun. And did they appreciate it? <laughs> they they loved it. I think it was probably their favourite <laughs> oh, really? today. Yeah, that we had all sorts of people. But um, we also did a lullaby about a takeaway, a Chinese takeaway. <laughs> it, you under, you couldn't yeah. want to see where this is going. So yeah, it's it's really all sorts. Well, and this is a wider question, I think, for everyone. Where does the music come? Is it you, forgive me, as a music director, thinking, oh, this is a moment, I can see there's a, a dramatic point in the text where I now need to step in, or are there, uh, or does it work the other way, where you as actors and performers say, do you know, uh, I'm going to start singing and you better follow me in, or is it a mixture of two? I, I'm always interested in the, next, the nexus point. I would say that there are points in the show where Alex will read the mood of the, uh, the, mood of the scene and someone will say something like, well, I challenge you to do this. He will begin a patter song, which the people on stage will not be particularly keen about for stuff although a few of them love doing it so occasionally it's Alex that decides it uh, occasionally though we do throw in those ever so cheesy musical theatre feed lines like I once had a dream yes. <laughs> cue music uh, have you so ever both? have you ever felt compelled not to accompany that line uh, so, sometimes I sort of wearily play a happy chord <laughs> 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 like, oh here we go again yeah but no um, a lot of the time it's um, yeah I can tell when the sort of they're itching to sing Although they can, a lot of the time they sort of hide it in slightly better ways than a, I had a dream once. <laughs> um, but yeah. Because you also provide a little bit of dramatic tension. So when a revelation occurs, you do do that. Yeah, I do, I, that's, yeah, that's quite exciting for me as well. So Because um, of course I, I like, like them, I don't know what's going on most of the time. So I'm sort of reacting, it, reacting to it as the audience reacts to it. So um, yeah, I try to sort of capture the, the mood as, as best I can. One of the things I really like about you as a group, if I may say, apart from being tremendously funny, is the fact that you all feel free to play with each other. You're very playful as a group, and that comes across on stage. I mean that in a nice way rather than a dangerously stalky way, obviously. Um, <laughs> but yes, well, shall we quote what happened today? There was a circumstance where a reprise was demanded of a totally different character. <laughs> well, actually not a totally different character, but um, I think most of us have thought the song had been put to bed. And it was a fairly complicated, it was the recipe song for a, yeah. a well-known branded cake. We do it. have a technical term for this sort of thing. It's called dickery. <laughs> um, yeah. As in dock. As in, as in dickery dock, yeah. yeah. Um, basically... It's, it's always fun to kind of, because that's how the audience knows it's improv and they get a laugh out of seeing us suffer. But we, but we always make sure that there's a way out. We wouldn't let someone like stew in their own juices. We are like, we work together, but we try not to show it. So yeah. <laughs> you want to show discord. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So in that situation, how I was singing the song and I evidently didn't know it, then Alex kind of just stopped halfway. <laughs> so I didn't have to make me and sing I, the whole I thing. I was ready to come in and make up one about what to do if you did yeah. stop. So, so it was, it's it funny was fun. and then everyone like backs each other up, so it's but, fine. But it was also true to the character because the character yeah. was playing was actually really incompetent making said brand. So actually it was so, fine. Yeah, so, 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 and so, I know that's what Georgie was thinking so, yeah. when she didn't get the lyrics right. Yeah. Yeah. I liked when I accidentally asked you to do that. It was all on purpose, really. Yes, yes. It's a highly planned skill job. I yeah, know. I, I, do, I'd like to ask a question, forgive me. You're, you're, you're Matthew. Name, Matthew, now you have a narrator role. Well, it's yeah. not a narrator role, it's, a, it's an audience facilitator role, which at one level looks like a really comfy job. Because yeah, you, oh, it you is, absolutely. Up, you sit on the chair and laugh at the next day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and may I say, you have a remarkably infectious laugh, because I think the audience is quite often looking at you, collapsing, falling over, <laughs> weeping, um, <laughs> with laughter, obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Most of the time. Yeah. But you also have a sort of role as a warm-up man as well. Yeah, I think it is quite important because we've had a few shows where we've had some some really stale audiences who don't have no. much to say and so it's really trying Frightened to frighten British audiences yeah and, but yeah. also we've had like big groups but we don't want to we don't want to make it all about their show we want to make sure everyone else is included so it's making sure that you take ideas which everyone in the audience wants to get behind and yeah I think it, it like clearly the rest of the show I'm sitting there and I just enjoy it with everyone else um, I think if I laugh it does it does actually have an effect on like I, I see the, the puns that Jim was making tonight about oh. the biscuits and so on and, and like yes. It gets people into the spirit of the show and depending on like what we do on stage, I think that goes for everyone on the, when they're sitting on the chairs as well. Mm. What they do and how they react to what's yeah. going on in the scene makes a massive difference to how the audience reacts. Well, that raises a very interesting point because it was quite interesting that when uh, performers weren't actively involved on the stage in the actual performing part, you all do appear to be sitting on the background going, sort of whisper, 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 how can we make this plot work? I mean, how much of, I mean, obviously I know it's a fully improvised, I'm, I'm not going to ask the stupid question which everybody asks, which yeah. is, you must plan this in advance, and over 10 minutes in, someone comes in and sings a duet with someone else. I know that's not the case, and I know it's all about proper imp impro. Yes, improv. Yes, absolutely. Um, however, you do make some um, cognitive decisions, for want of a phrase, rather than subconscious ones, I mean yeah. if we're talking improv, um, 
How far do you allow yourself to do that and at what level are you doing it? Are you just saying, in this uh, next scene, I think it would be really helpful if we end it with cracking open a safe or... Uh, forgive me, if you're happy to tell me these yeah. state I mean, secrets. So, to, to sort of to use today's show as an example... Would you like to give us the name of today's Ed, show? Ed. <laughs> and the name of today's show. Oh, what? oh today's, <laughs> the name of today's show is not called Ed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't go breaking my tar. Don't go breaking my tar. In the eternal war between biscuit and cake, it was really the, uh, of yeah, course. the apogee of all the musicals you could have had. <laughs> Naturally. Yeah. Um, so, I think it, some shows' plots suggest themselves more cleanly than others today felt like one where we needed a bit more time so in a circumstance like that if someone goes up and sort of does an opening number which I took today um, and tries to throw out ideas that can be developed for plot but could also be left so if the people on the chairs are going well this is the sort of direction we'll take it in but similarly if they can hear something thrown out by someone on stage so today for example establishing the idea of a secret recipe for the popular brand of cake, um, <laughs> which um, establishes sort of a route down which the rest of the company can take it. Um, we're never more than a couple of scenes ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we'll always adapt to whatever's on stage. So even if we say, like, this is what we kind of want to do in the next two scenes, someone might go up and say something and you'll be like, right, well, that's not going to work. Let's move on and find something else. So... It's very much, we do structure, but it can be really flexible. And I think it's really important that we also negate any accusations of having a, a show-long structure mm. by having Matt stop the show at about the halfway yes. point yes. and ask for the next scene. And that often changes completely what we had planned. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah. It's, yeah, but you the, you yeah. turn halfway through, essentially. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. yeah for example. Or handbrake turn, yeah, perhaps. We had, um, we had a, a show uh, the other day which was set at a band camp and halfway through the audience decided that they wanted to see a T-Rex invasion and an entire song sung by a T-Rex in T-Rex. Yeah, we so asked for a style of music and they we thought, oh, we thought, oh, it might be hip hop, might be rock. No, their style was roaring. <laughs> their style was roaring. And um, so one of the most happened. important things we have to do as an improv troupe is um, is listening. Like, yeah. not just to each other, but to what's going on the stage, what's going on on the chairs, and what the audience enjoy. Because if they like something, then we know what sort of audience they are and what direction to take the plot and the jokes. And what audience were we this evening? A good one. A very yeah. good one. Yeah. 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 No, Your Honour, you're so generous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of questions for everybody. Uh, this is a question I've been asking a number of improv groups that I've been seeing uh, who do musicals, and I genuinely like your opinion on it. Most improv musicals, in fact all that I've seen, have always been comedy. Is it possible, because the, obviously the advantage of comedy is it smooths over the edges, makes the plot work, and people will laugh with you and go with you, and it doesn't absolutely need to cohere. If, is it possible to do a speech marks straight musical? Yes. Yes. Oh, right, good. I like um, this answer. So, so we've how we rehearse for this is to just get drilled to do this again and again and again. So, um, at the end of term at uni, we were staying up in our uni houses, like trying loads of different yeah. scenarios, and we had a couple that were genuinely really sad. We had one called Clone Topia, and the one that. Um, AJ, the director, was just giving us audience suggestions which yeah. were devilishly difficult to try and drill us for it. So for that, we had a faulty clone and a pregnant woman. Oh. We had to get into that. And it was actually... I think I think we decided the phrase was tragically beautiful. That was, the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was my only note, I think, for the entire show. Tragically beautiful in oh. capitals. But you can, you can do it. And I think sometimes almost the comedy comes out better if there is an aspect of reality or tragedy yeah. or something. But um, we found here that the audiences at Edinburgh particularly... Yeah. Like they respond to the comedy so well that it kind of takes off oh, in yeah, that direction. Is, um, what I would have said was is that uh, a straight improv musical would work very well, but that's not what people have paid to see. Yeah, yeah. No, they want a comedy. They, yeah. they, they, they are, they are wanting to come to be entertained for an evening, and they don't want us to throw something out that's yeah. devilishly yeah, serious. But it is However, possible. it is possible, and if the audience do, for whatever reason, cheer of an evening for something more serious, was contemplating that we might get something World War One based because it's mm. uh, the yeah, centenary yeah. this time around, we would be able to crack something. Out. And if the audience, if that was the most popular thing of the evening, then absolutely you we do. would yeah. be able. Yeah. You, yeah. We would throw out whatever the audience wanted, and if it was clear from what they they said and their their demeanour uh, that they wanted something more serious, yeah, then listening, and adapting. listening and adapting, and would be excited to do it, I think, because it's a different type of challenge. But it's, wouldn't it be harder? Do you think? Um, it seems to me it might need to be tighter in order to bring coherence. To I think it's higher risk. Yeah. Yeah. because yes. comedy, obviously, if something goes wrong, you can make a joke out of it. It's higher risk, but I think when it goes right, it 
it pays is, off. It pays off massively. It it's really very impressive. And it yeah. definitely feels very different to do a straighter one, as it were. Um, but I think potentially it has more scope for interesting characters when you have mm. time to not to not necessarily just do a character that's broad um, and to bring all the plot line together. If you have a really interesting plot and quite a tragic sc scenario, you can work around that quite. It's, it's an interesting That's thing to get to do. That's a great answer. Thank you. I mean, you're the first group really to engage with it, I think, in some senses. Um, and my final question, if you don't mind, is, <laughs> in your view, you're a musical and a very successful musical, but is the conclusion of the musical within the time limit, is it more important to have a coherent plot ending than a good end of show song? I mean, ideally it would be both. Yeah. That well, would well, be of course, the dream. Yes, absolutely. Yes, quite. <laughs> um... I think coherent plot is a coherent plot is obviously very very necessary but having a really good ending number it makes the audience leave with feeling really happy feeling really uplifted and often with the whole comedy side of it things some things can be forgotten by an audience course, so yeah. if you have an uplifting song that you're leaving with that kind of dictates the general tone that they have in so. a way that their plot is less important therefore people are quite happy to less that it doesn't need to click know, quite so I successful think, at the I end I think it de depends how big the plot how big the plot reveal is. So, um, for example, we did You Cruise, You Lose, which was set on a cruise liner the other day, and that was great fun. Um, and we had a really, like, upbeat, happy ending number to that. And there had been, within that, the um, reveal that one of the characters was a daughter of the other character. And we had this collective gasp from all the audience as they worked it out themselves, and that everyone in the audience got it and everyone knew it, but we didn't actually do the reveal on stage because we chose to do the ending number instead, which tied everybody yeah. together. Um, so in that case, ending number is more important because it covered the plot as well. Um, and like brought that into it but I think you made a very good point there in um, the audience guessing for themselves yeah. because it, we wouldn't say our plots are generic but if an audience can see where it's going they then it makes they, them feel clever mm. so they absolutely love getting sure. to the plot twist the three lines before the plot yeah. twist is revealed and to be able to set something up that like up like that is always really really nice if they really, got really nice. before the plot twist was revealed then yeah. that might be a problem which they but... did the other day <laughs> oh, at they? the uh, audience suggestion in the middle they were like He's our father, and it's like, shh, spoilers. <laughs> uh, but that's wonderful uh, that those things can come across, especially in something improvised, if you can layer up a plot twist from sort of scene three that has a massive reveal in scene nine that some of the audience may not have got, but like 90% of the audience are sitting there going, I called that, that's excellent. They leave uh, pretty happy. They did what I wanted them to. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. I'm sure, that, yeah, the, the audience will forgive a sort of what can sometimes appear like a slapdash plot if they're going away with like a, a melody they can remember so a lot of the time we we're told like oh like when we, were, we were just giving notes the other day and a woman walked past saying oh my son was singing the Small song the, yeah, yeah the song at the end of the thing so it's quite nice to hear people like walking away singing tunes that you know we've just made up <laughs> yes. uh, there's yeah. a, a joy well, you won't it. remember them tomorrow will you? Oh, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> no. so they might but you might not well, which maybe. is ironic yeah. 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 Right, fantastic and people can find you on online do you have social interactivity <laughs> yeah um, our website is www.theimprovmusical.co.uk and you can uh, tweet us on at improv underscore musical. Thank you very much. Well, I wish you huge success for the rest of the run as, uh, as, you're, going to, as you're going to the bitter, bitter end, I notice. Thank you very much indeed. But I do appreciate one of the skills is to keep it attuned, isn't it? You have to, you're at fever pitch and you have to keep it at that pitch to make it work. Today, it was a fantastic show. I can only judge today, I'm afraid. I'm, I might come back for a World War I one, though. <laughs> um, come back, suggest yeah. it. We'll see what the audience think. Different but, show every night. Yeah. Oh, well, absolutely. That's the joy, isn't yeah. it? You could yeah. just come and see your show and do nothing else. <laughs> there we are. There's the fringe for you. <laughs> but ser seriously, thank you very much, everybody for your fun, uh, kind talk and thank you for a lovely evening thank, oh, you, thank you very much musical talk well I can't thank everyone who's spoken to me enough there you heard four very different interviews and four very different approaches to improvised musical creation from waiting for the call the improvised musical Baron Sternlook's big naughty improvised musical the Oxford Imps and the Curious Case of the Improvised Musical, and lastly, and not leastly, Warwick University's The Improv Musical. And in between that, songs especially recorded for musical talk by showstopper, The Improvised Musical, in 2009. My thanks to everyone who I spoke to, either recently or in the past. 
It's been a privilege to see and hear and investigate the creation of improvised musicals, and I hope it's whetted your appetite to go and see one, or more, where you are, because they're based all around the country. And there are many, many, many more companies than, than those I've mentioned today. For example, alone, there was an improvised puppet musical up in Edinburgh this summer, as well as Baby Wants Candy, who were there again. And the Showstoppers had also developed a spin-off musical for children, which you heard me mention, in the context of dungarees, in the course of one of the interviews. And no episode of Musical Talk talking about improvised musicals will be complete without me saying please do go along to the daddies of them all, the Showstoppers musical. It's called Showstopper, the improvised musical. You can find their website online and they're on tour around the country. Go and see them if at all possible. And we'll finish today with one final song from Showstopper. And as you'll hear from Dylan Emery, who introduces it, it is a showstopper. How fitting. Goodbye. <laughs> now I think, now I think it is time, before we really get to the finale of this, for a showstopper. So, a showstopper is a song that happens usually before some big, important, epic part of a musical that bears no connection to the plot whatsoever. So, <laughs> Vishnu, he's a torturer, but he's a wise torturer. I don't think he always wanted to be a torturer. What did he want to be? <laughs> Sorry? A lumberjack. A lumberjack, of course. <laughs> Monty Python references aside, what else? <laughs> Something more exotic, maybe. A pirate. A pirate. <laughs> a pirate. A DJ. A DJ. A Something that is Persian. Something that is more. What is his, his goal? Not necessarily a professional, but what did he always want? Sorry? A snake charmer. A snake charmer. I'm So this will turn into a fabulous showstopper. <laughs> Done in a kind of Sondheim, a Sondheim patter style of the man who's a torturer and really just wants to be a belly dancer. It'll turn into a huge number. The soul feels good when it has done good work. It feels light. <laughs> Feel the palm trees on my face. Please. <laughs> <It breathes. laughs> it is good to be alive. Perhaps when the rebellion is done, I will be able to pursue my real dreams. <laughs>
And then they start to sing a song named Patter song, and they all join in in different bits with amazing internal rhyming, and they do it now! <laughs> start shaking, start shaking, don't start quaking. In your heart, just start quaking. Episode of Musical Talk edited and presented by Foss Ricketts. Copyright Musical Talk 2014, except for the songs where the copyright remains with Showstopper, the improvised music. I'll, uh, I'll clean up the choreography before I send it to uh, Cameron. Okay. That was that was lovely. That was 20 minutes. Are you all relatively happy with that? Yeah, yeah. that was lovely as far as I was concerned. I'm going to turn it off now. Oh, and I have one final favour. Is may I take a photograph? Of course. Yes. Of course. Sure.